podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Bernardo Castro. Bernardo has a PhD in computer engineering, and he subsequently got one in philosophy as well, focusing on the philosophy of mind. Bernardo has spent years thinking and writing about the nature of consciousness and has written extensively on the subject, including several books. Bernardo and I discussed a variety of topics related to consciousness, including the psychological phenomenon of dissociation, the difference between conscious awareness and metaconsciousness, and why that's relevant to attempts in neuroscience to study the neural correlates of consciousness. We touched on language and the human ability to generate abstractions and re-representations of our conscious experiences. We got into the so-called hard problem of consciousness and why it persists and is so hard. We discussed how all of these things relate to the philosophy of mind that Bernardo advocates, which is a form of idealism, the idea being that there's only one kind of substance in the universe and that it is mental in nature rather than material. We also got into the link between the quest to create artificial forms of consciousness and the origins of life. We talked about Carl Jung and Jungian psychology and the notion of psychological archetypes and what that actually means. And we got into the link, the link between idealism and various religious traditions. Lastly, towards the end, we discussed the psychedelic experience, including some of Bernardo's own experiences with psilocybin, what we know about the underlying neurophysiology of these states, and whether they might serve as good models for the conscious experiences that accompany the organic death process that we will all eventually go through. This is a two and a half-ish hour long conversation, so we covered a lot of ground, but I think it was very interesting. And if you're interested in the nature of mind and the nature of consciousness, I think it's worth listening to all of this, even if you can't get it all in one shot. Bernardo certainly knows a lot and has thought quite deeply about these subjects, so it was really exciting to get to talk with him about these things. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing on the Mind of Matter podcast, please do help support us. You can do that by liking, sharing, and subscribing. You can do that by supporting the podcast financially by subscribing to my Substack, mindandmatter.substack.com, and you can subscribe to the video version on YouTube. You can also check out any of the links in the episode descriptions to uh, various products and services that I've used and that I enjoy. Uh, Going through those links will help support the podcast and, and keep me growing. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Bernardo Castro. Bernardo Castro, how are you? doing great. Happy to be here, Nick. Thank you for joining me. Can you let everyone know who you are, where you're joining us from, and just give like a a concise summary of what your academic training is in so people have a sense for where where you're going to be coming from today? Yeah, I am speaking to you from the south of the Netherlands, writing between uh, Antwerp and Dusseldorf uh, and Amsterdam on that triangle. Um, I have a background in computer science. I have a doctorate in computer science and a doctorate in philosophy of mind, so a dual background. I have some background in physics because of my professional life. I used to work in data acquisition at uh, CERN uh, in Switzerland. It was actually my very first job in life. And I've been writing about uh, uh, ontology, philosophy of mind for the past 15 years and have some acquaintance with the technical literature in neuroscience of consciousness. Yeah, so you've got this interesting background where you have formal training in computer science, computer engineering, this background in the physical sciences uh, that's related to that, and then you became a philosopher, basically. And we're going to spend most of our time today talking about mind stuff, consciousness, and, and related topics. The thing I wanted to get you talking about first is this very interesting psychological phenomenon that I've discussed on this show in, in different ways on a few occasions and that's dissociation. And I want to start off by asking you about dissociative identity disorder and how that can manifest neurologically. So t- tell people about, about that and what we know about it. Yeah, dissociation in general is something we are all acquainted with. Non-pathological, mild levels of dissociation happen when you don't remember something. Uh, a dream state is partly a dissociative state because you don't identify with the parts of your mind that are generating the dream environment. You only identify with the dream character or avatar. So we can all become dissociated. When we become confused, 
uh, under stress. That's an example of dissociation. But dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, is an extreme sustained form of dissociation in which one mind appears to fragment itself into multiple distinct or cognitively separate centers of awareness, each one with its own selected memories, with its own dispositions, personality traits. Uh, they, they call themselves by different names. Um, now, this has existed. We have known about this since the 19th century. But for over a century, uh, there were reasons not to take it seriously because it's not something you could diagnose objectively. So there was always that doubt that the patient was faking it in order to get attention mm. or get away with some socially awkward uh, situations. But uh, with the ad uh, um, advent of uh, neuroimaging in the early 21st century, we now have means to diagnose DID uh, objectively using fMRI images. That was work done by Yolanda Schlumpf and her team here in the Netherlands in 2014. Uh, we have work done with uh, EEG um, uh, in, in Germany in 2015, a woman suffering from DID uh, who claimed to have multiple alters, some of which claimed to be blind. The, the neuroscientists had this brilliant idea of instrumenting the woman with an EEG cap while a blind alter was in executive control. And uh, lo and behold, there was no brain activity in the visual cortex, even though the woman's eyes were wide open. And we know that her eyes and visual system organically speaking, work, because when a sighted alter was again in control or the host personality brain activity in the visual cortex uh, would reappear. So today we know that this is a real condition. It can be objectively diagnosed, and it has the surprising property of uh, uh, having one mind appear to itself as many separate minds. Interesting. So, so this case of a woman with a blind alter, that term alter, that just mean, that just refers to the separate centers of awareness contained within one brain. And you're saying that there was this case study of a woman who had, who, who could see and her eyes were functioning and everything, but one of her alters claimed to be blind and they were doing EEG me measurements such that when they look at the EEG signal um, for the visual cortex, the blind alters EEG looked like an actual an actual person with physical blindness as EEG, EEG would look like. There was no activity. Uh, I don't think the neuroscientists went so far as to say it's the same as a blind person, but they couldn't see discernible activity beyond noise levels uh, in the visual cortex, even though her eyes were open. So yeah, that gives you pause for thought because dissociation seems not only to create uh, islands of mentation that are cognitively uh, isolated, uh, but it seems to be capable of literal blindness. I see. And in these cases with such individuals, is the is the default alter or the default person that's speaking, it, do they claim to be aware of the alters or are they completely unaware of each other? You have both cases because now we can retroactively analyze the clinical literature that was not taken seriously for over a century. So now that we know that the condition is real, now, now we are sitting on a mountain of data that didn't require, that didn't demand enough attention from us in the past. So it's an abundance of riches now. And there is clinical evidence for both, for alters that are well aware of the other's existences and for alters that are not. And there is, and that's the most interesting part, there is an abundance of clinical evidence, even recent one, uh, research done uh, in Harvard by Deidre Barrett, um, there is evidence that alters are co-conscious. In other words, it's not a matter of rebooting the computer with a different operating system. No, the different alters are always present. The ones that are not in executive control, they are still conscious and you can even try to play tricks on the alters that are in executive control. To undermine other alters. So the other thing this reminds me of, I mean, this can be very, very uh, hard and weird for people to wrap their minds around. Um, but the other, you know, on the topic of just the idea that you can have multiple types of consciousness or multiple centers of awareness within a single brain that may or may not have access to the contents of the other, you know, it reminds me of the, the famous cases of the so-called split brain patients that that are defined in the literature um, going back several decades now. Are you familiar with those cases? Yeah, there's there's contention about, I, I don't know what you're about to say now, but there is some late new results that seem to bring, to bring doubt to the earlier conclusions, but go ahead. 
Well, can you just describe uh, the, the sort of classic split brain results and maybe then bring us up to speed on what you just referred to? Yeah. So there is this notion that if you split the two brain hemispheres, then you get two parallel consciousness consciousnesses and you no longer have a sort of unified field of awareness. Um, I don't think that holds up. Um, if you talk to patients after surgery, they will report to you that they feel exactly the same like they felt before. Uh, but some quirks appear, one of which uh, can be um, a blind sight. Uh, blind sight is when you report to not be able to see, but you act as though you could see. Uh, like uh, if you report that you cannot see anything on, on, on the left side of a visual field and somebody throws you a ball on the left side, you raise your hand and catch it. Um, and if, if the, uh, the psychiatrists or the neuroscientists confront you with that, like you claim you cannot see, but you held your hand and you caught the ball, the people will report, well, I just raised my hand by, by chance. It was just a coincidence. So you have this amazing uh, uh, cognitive dissonance is happening. I think what this might show is that uh, um, impairments of certain types of brain function, when you, when you prevent communication between certain types of brain areas under certain circumstances, what you destroy is uh, metacognition. You destroy your ability not to experience, but to know that you are experiencing, to bring that experience into the microscope of explicit introspection, to examine the contents of your own mind at a metacognitive level. I think that's what's impaired. I wouldn't go as far as to say that split brain patients have two alters. I don't think there is enough clinical basis for that. I see. And sticking on dissociation for a moment, you know, there's also the phenomenon of you know, acute and reversible dissociation, which can be induced by uh, stressful events, which I think you mentioned earlier, or, or drugs. And uh, some people have experience with this, where you, know, you take um, a dissociative psychoactive drug, it induces this very bizarre state where it, you know, it's very hard to describe and wrap your head around. Uh, you know, when someone is in this state, they'll, they'll say things like, well, I, I was sitting there and I look, I look around, I see everything. I can see everything in my visual field. I look down at my hand and I see it. So the sensory information is not being disrupted. I understand intellectually that I'm looking at my hand, my arm, and yet somehow the body that you're seeing doesn't really register as belonging to you. And it's, it's very bizarre, but that is the kind of thing that people will report. Um, this kind of state can even be induced in, in animals and experimental situations. And so I'm hoping you can describe for us what you think this means in terms of how the mind is generating a sense of self and integrating the sensory information into its model of itself. Let's, let's get people thinking about how the brain is generating these models. Yeah, just to, to sort of dovetail with what you said, there are, there are instances in the literature of people who suffer car crashes. And instead of losing their memories, they lose the sense of ownership of their memories. Hmm. They remember the entire lives, but they, they relate to it as if it were the life of somebody else. They say, that was not me. I remember it from a first-person perspective, but that wasn't me. It doesn't feel like it was me. So you can have many types of dissociation. I mean, we just talked about perceptual dissociation. You can't see because you're dissociated from you know, the cognitive mechanisms associated with perception. Uh, ownership, you can lose the feeling of ownership. You can have memory dissociation. Different authors can hold different memories, so you don't have to deal with the stress of knowing everything. So there are many forms of mild and severe dissociation. I think what this tells us is that the mind is a dynamic web of cognitive associations and dissociations. Associations are being formed and unformed all the time. Uh, it, it is a constant dance. In which it's like a, the dance of the starlings uh, in the afternoon sky. They come together, they fly apart, they form these intricate patterns. And under ordinary conditions, that's what our minds are doing all the time. We are associating, dissociating, forming different views of the self. Um, and what we call the self is a narrative that emerges from this dance. And it's a narrative that almost invariably is, 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 is not based on, on the data. It's not based on reason. Um, that narrative itself is a sort of a, a byproduct of this cognitive associative dance uh, that characterizes what mind is. 
Interesting. Yeah. So there's, you know, to think of it in sort of a cartoon fashion, there really are just many different streams of information and any number of them can become dissociated from this sort of model that we have of ourselves that normally feels like it's always one thing. Many of these things don't dissociate under normal circumstances. And so from uh, the first person perspective, people go through most or all of their lives never having certain kinds of dissociative experiences. So it, it doesn't feel to most people like this is possible. And yet these interesting, these interesting cases show us that it is. You mentioned something a little while ago that I want to dwell on. You mentioned metacognition and uh, awareness that we are aware versus the awareness per se. So can you just explicitly state for people, how do you think about consciousness proper versus metacognition? And why is that, why is that important? So what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness um, is just raw experience. It's the qualitative aspect. It's what it is like to be us. If there is something, anything it is like to be us, then we are phenomenally conscious. And phenomenal consciousness, or simply consciousness, um, does not depend on higher level mental functions. Um, it's just a sort of a raw property of mind, which is to have experiences, to have this qualitative aspect to its inner dynamics. Um, Metaconsciousness is when mind sort of folds in upon itself to examine its own dynamics at a meta level. So if your perceptions are representations, metaconsciousness entails a re-representation of your mental con uh, 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 contents. So you represent your mental contents once, they are representations, and then you represent them again, one level up. That re-representation is not the original experience, it is the awareness that you are having the original experience. And of course, you can have re-representations -re of meta-meta consciousness. It can go on forever, um, but it is that first critical step when mind re-represents its own contents, that's when we can start talking about metaconsciousness. You can also talk about metacognition, but technically metacognition does not necessarily entail consciousness. I think they always go hand in hand, but you know, the terms are used in a technical sense. So metaconsciousness entails metacognition, but not necessarily the other way around, as far as you know, the, the, the definitions go. Mm -hmm. And this distinction, can you describe its importance relative to the neuroscientific study of consciousness? So many people um, historically and, and in the present day study the so-called neural correlates of consciousness. Can you describe what they're talking about and what that means and then how this distinction you've made can sort of muddy the waters there? Yeah. So in this traditionally, the study, at least until 2015, the study of consciousness from a neuroscientific perspective has been entirely based on subjective reports. Uh, so you perform uh, 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 brain function scans with fMRI, MEG, EEG, whatever, um, and, and the subject then reports what is being experienced from a first-person perspective. And then you try to find the correlates between the experiences reported and the patterns of brain activity that are being measured. And that's how you come to the NCCs, the neural correlates of consciousness, by linking subjective report to, to empirical objective measurement of brain activity. And of course, the whole thing relies on subjective report. The problem is that subjective report requires that the subject not only have the experience, but he also has to know that he has the experience. Otherwise, otherwise he will not report it, not even to himself or herself. So report entails metaconsciousness. So much of the work that has been done on the NCCs, the neurocorrelates of consciousness, are in fact the neurocorrelates of metaconsciousness. Now, some awareness about this has emerged in the last years, um, in recent years, and um, there is an attempt now to come up with this no report paradigm. Um, but of course, the whole thing is experimentally very cumbersome because it requires on your making certain assumptions about something the subject is experiencing, but doesn't know that they are experiencing. So uh, how do you know <laughs> then if, if, if it's not based on subjective report? So that's a, that's a significant operational um, difficulty in the neuroscience of consciousness. But more importantly, it, it is 
the fact that many neuroscientists have failed to understand this distinction that has led to a, to a lot of misunderstanding about uh, what consciousness is, how it expresses itself, because people just conflate the two. The conflation has begun at the very birth of modern psychology. What Freud and Jung called the unconscious was just non-metacognitive, dissociated contents of experience. In other words, it was phenomenally conscious, but not accessible from the point from the point mm. of view of the ego. The ego could not introspect into those experiences, but they were still phenomenal. In other words, they were still consciousness-like, consciousness stuff. But they gave it the name the unconscious. Mm -hmm. They should have called it the unmetaconscious. I see. Yeah, this is um this is something that, that you just see throughout the history of many thinkers. Um, are you familiar with the book uh, by Julian Jaynes called The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind? Bicameral Mind, yeah. It's a, very, it's a very interesting and weird book, but that's another case where when he said consciousness, he was talking, I think, about meta-consciousness. Meta I think it's very likely. I think even modern neuroscientists, I mean, there are some glaring examples. I've seen papers I'm not going to cite the names, but I've seen papers in which in the discussion of the results, uh, the author of the paper basically says, okay, this cannot be conscious because of this, this, and this, since what characterizes consciousness is report, and therefore, and, and I'm like, well, he's talking about metaconsciousness. Well, he's trying to talk about experience. He's talking about something that comes on top of experience. Mm -hmm. um, so you see this conflation to this day. Yeah, and it does... Um I mean, if we go back to the blindside example for a minute, this is just to rearticulate this if people have not encountered it before. I remember learning about this for the first time in, in my neurobiology training. I mean, literally, there are forms of brain damage to the primary visual cortex where people say they cannot see anything, and yet they behave as if um, they can see Blind. things, as Bernardo Blind mentioned sight. earlier. Yeah. And if you take you know, if you don't make the distinction that, that you introduced to us, Bernardo, and say like, okay, the damage is really to their ability to be, um, to report what they are in fact aware of rather than awareness being absent. It is very difficult to imagine what the alternative explanation is. How, how could they truly not have any awareness of it and explain what, and we could explain the phenomenon. Um, I actually don't know what a good alternative explanation would be. So, Oh, if you, if you adopt a physicalist metaphysics and you think that certain patterns of brain activity somehow generate awareness, you could just say, well, blindsight, these are mental processes that are not conscious. They are not part of the NCCs, but they feed information into the NCCs so the subject can act upon these perceptions, which are real, just not conscious, uh, and the subject cannot report them. The problem is that you see the whole thing is circular, and that's one of the, the greatest dangers uh, of misinterpreting uh, the science. Um, there is this paper by Jonathan Schooler in 2002 in which he shows that there are dissociations between the contents of consciousness and the contents of metaconsciousness. They don't necessarily go hand in hand. What you think you are experiencing is not necessarily what you're actually experiencing. And then th this can be experimentally um, determined as Jonathan Schooler has done 20 years ago. So that's one issue. You rely on reports, while those reports may actually not be uh, consistent with what is actually being experienced because of this dissociation between these two entities. And the other entity, the, the, sorry, the other <laughs> the other problem, is that um, you may be misled into thinking that uh, the notion that the brain generates awareness is sort of confirmed by by blind sight. Um, you may think that, okay, that's evidence that there is, you know, mental somethings, mental goings on that uh, accurately perceive, uh, but they are not part of the NCCs. Therefore, you need certain patterns of brain activity in order to generate consciousness. While, in fact, the correct interpretation, all you can say is that you need certain patterns of brain activity to be meta-conscious to explicitly introspect into something. And this has enormous theoretical ramifications to mention just the most glaring example, Giulio Tononi's uh, information integration theory uh, of consciousness. Giulio and, uh, and Christoph have, uh, Christoph Koch have been promoting that heavily for over a decade now. Um, and the concept of phi, you know, that you have to have this closed loop of information integration in the anatomy of the brain uh, for consciousness to arise 
and that closed loop has to integrate more than a certain number that reflects the, the amount of information in there. That threshold is called phi. So if the information in that loop crosses phi, then you're conscious. And of course, that whole thing, the value of phi, was determined experimentally based on subjective reports. So they attribute their theory to be an account of consciousness. Well, in, in fact, it's a very good, very accurate account of metaconsciousness. What do you need to happen in the brain in terms of closed loops of information integration for, for you to be able to be aware of being aware, of knowing that you are experiencing? So the whole thing about ITT, information integration theory, is about metaconsciousness. It doesn't begin to say anything about consciousness. Can you talk a little bit about so, so so you've mentioned this this concept of re-representation that when you're aware of your awareness there's this extra layer of processing and abstraction that the brain is somehow doing how does the extent to which our brains normally do that across say a sleep wake cycle vary how does this tie into the the weirdness of dreams and uh the, the difference that we all naturally perceive between uh, our dream world experience and our waking consciousness experience, because it would seem to be related to this in an important way. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's been research done in 2007, and that's the one I remember. There has been more research done on that. But uh, it has been shown that metacognition reduces substantially during dreams, that uh, during our dreams we are experiencing, but we are not telling ourselves, oh, I am experiencing this. Because if we did... We would immediately ask questions about continuity, like how did I arrive here? What am I doing here? Where am I going next? And then you would have a lucid dream, which is what lucid dreams are. Lucid dreams are dreams in which you are metacognizant. And regular in regular dreams, you are not. And then you might say, well, but I report my dreams. So I had to be metacognizant. No, no, no. You are metacognizant when you remember your dreams. And then by mirroring them, by reflecting them on the mirror of reflection, uh, uh, in the mirror of metaconsciousness, after you are awake, by appealing to memory, only then do you know that you had those experiences. But during the dream, you are like a leaf in a tsunami. You are just going along with the experience. You are experiencing, but you're not metacognizant of the experience. Yeah. So this, this, as you mentioned, is related to the, the ephemeral nature of dreams in terms of our ability to remember them. I think everyone has this experience where you wake up, you remember it vividly, but then within seconds or a split second, it falls through your fingers like sand and you can no longer remember it. And basically this probably has something to do with the fact that you weren't meta aware um, in that state. And so somehow this must be related to the ability to encode that in memory. Yes. I don't, I, I don't remember explicit research in this regard, so I have to qualify what I'm about to say now as my opinion. <laughs> um, but uh, I have a very strong opinion. To me, it's obvious. It's not even an opinion. I know this. Um, memory is facilitated by metacognition. We don't remember the experience per se. What we remember is what we tell ourselves about the experience as we are having it. So if, if you lose a loved one, the, the, the main part of the memory, you know, 35 years later, is what you were telling yourself when you lost that loved one. Even when you see something, I see a ship in the horizon, and you remember that a week later, because you remember having told yourself implicitly, oh, that's a ship on the horizon. Um, when we don't do that, uh, memory pathways don't seem to form. Uh, everything becomes very elusive. It's, you know, like you said, it sort of flows like sand through the fingers, we lose it. Yeah. I mean, this fits perfectly well with the uh, very well-documented phenomenon of you know, the, uh, the, the low quality of eyewitness testimony. You know, so two yeah. people observe a crime and one or both of them just get very obvious facts about what happened wrong. And you know, it starts to make sense in the context of what you just told us. If you know, what they're not remembering the scene per se, they're remembering uh, what they were thinking during the scene, basically. Exactly. What they were telling themselves metacognitively that they were experiencing. Yeah. So, so another way to think about the difference between the dream state is, you know, while you're dreaming, you're obviously having perceptions, but you're not thinking, or at least not thinking in the way that you are when you're awake. And I'm wondering if maybe this is a good spot for you to uh, describe for people how you think about the difference between thought and thinking and perception. Well, perception is mediated by the sense organs. Um, there has to be stimulus uh, on the measurement surfaces of our sense organs, namely 
retinas, your drums, um, uh, mucus lining of the nose, surface of the tongue and surface of the skin. Something has to be impinging on those measurement surfaces of our sense organs that then get translated into what we call percept. Um, but the dreams are not mediated by the sense organs. They are entirely endogenous. They, they are self-generated imagery. And, uh, and because often we, can't, we cannot distinguish between a dream and real life, while we are in the dream and after, afterwards, you know, of course, but during the dream, often we cannot uh, distinguish between dreams and, and real life. What that shows us is that the mind is perfectly capable of endogenous gener endogenously generating the entire imagery that we associated with reality, with the world we inhabit. And it has gone as far as some people like a new Seth today, they, they would describe perception as a sort of a, a controlled hallucination, a hallucination of the same kind as dreams, but which is modulated by uh, what impinges on the sense organs. So the mechanisms are the same, the same brain areas, the same patterns of brain activity are involved when you experience something for real, when you dream of it, or when you remember it. It's always the same brain areas. No, uh, you, uh, watching someone uh, hit a soccer ball uh, is correlated with certain patterns of activity. Remembering watching someone hit a soccer ball is correlated with the same patterns of brain activity. And dreaming of someone hitting a soccer ball is correlated with the same patterns of brain activity. So it, it, you know, the mind is engendering the imagery we call reality and the imagery we call dreams and memories. Yeah, one of the one of the other reasons dreams are so intriguing is that I mean, as you as you grow up and you start to dwell on these things, you do start to get a sense of oh, okay, um, these are endogenously generated images. Somehow, my mind is able to concoct these things, and it's not it doesn't work like a video camera. That's sort of the naive view you start when you're very young of okay, when I'm looking at the world, it's like a video camera recording what's actually out there, and it's giving you sort of a, a one to one. Um, completely filled in view of what's out there. But of course, a lot of what's going on in the brain has to do with actually filtering out information, so to speak. There's, there's more information flowing in that we're aware of. This information gets shaped and filtered in different ways before we get a visual image that we're perceiving. And the other, the other thing that starts to tie into this is the experiences that people have on psychedelics. And so to sort of Bridge, bridge the gap here. I want to uh, read a quote from Aldous Huxley that I think you'll probably be familiar with and maybe get your reaction to it to get us thinking about some of these ideas. So I think this is from The Doors of Perception, which you quote in your book, uh, The Idea of the World. But this quote that's very interesting from Huxley, who is not a neuroscientist, who was writing in, I believe, the 40s or 50s, he said this, to make biological survival possible, mind at large, his term, has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and the nervous system. What comes out the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness which will help us stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. To formulate and express the contents of this reduced awareness, man has invented and endlessly elaborated those symbol systems and implicit philosophies we call languages. Every individual at is at once the beneficiary and the victim of this linguistic tradition. The beneficiary, beneficiary in as much as language gives access to accumulated records of other people's experience, and the victim, insofar as it confirms him in the belief that this reduced awareness is the only awareness. And I'll just leave it at that. But what does this quote mean to you? And, and what do you make of this, uh, this term he uses of the reducing valve? Huxley was a very observant, intelligent uh, human being. We know that. And, and you don't need to be a neuroscience to observe your own mind and extract some conclusions about it. But I think what the data and the reasoning, reliable mathematical reasoning, what they are showing us today is that it's much worse than even Huxley would have dared to imagine. What's going on is much more than just filtering. If you look at the, wor the work of uh, Carl Friston about inferential perception, the inferential mind that what we see is what our mind infers about the world it's not the world as it actually is if you look at the work done by donald hoffman uh, on on the notion that uh, game theory proves that evolution would not favor us seeing the world as it is 
it would favor us seeing the world in whatever way, distorted way, invented way, hallucinated way, it would favor survival. Um, and, and then you realize that uh, people who agree with these two gentlemen, maybe even they themselves, um, they, they take the implications of this realization up to a certain point beyond which they are no longer comfortable. In other words, we like to think that reality by and large is more or less like we see. We filter out a lot of stuff, we distort some other stuff, we invent some stuff, but by and large, on average, we are in the right ballpark. But if you look at the mathematics of what Carl Friston did, uh, if you look at what Donald Hoffman has been doing, uh, you cannot stop there. It's, it's an entirely arbitrary stopping point. You have to bite the bullet all the way, and you have to understand that the screen of perception is not a transparent window into the world as it actually is. The screen of perception is like a dashboard of dials on an airplane cockpit, and that airplane has no windows. And we were born in that cockpit. We have never seen the world as it actually is. All we have is the cockpit. Now, the cockpit is very important. It has given to us by evolution to provide accurate, salient information about the world. A pilot can fly a plane safely by instruments alone in a dark night during a thunderstorm. You don't need the transparent windshield. In fact, you don't want to look through it because it will be misleading. It will disorientate you. We are in the position of that pilot, except that uh, we have never seen through the windows. There are no windows. We were born in that cockpit. All we have is the dashboard. And we think the dashboard is the world. No, the dashboard conveys salient, important information, even accurate, about the world. But the world doesn't look like a dashboard, if you know what I mean. The world as it is in itself is bound to not look anything like the form, shapes, colors, and geometrical relationships uh, that we see on the screen of perception, because that's the world impinging on our sense organs and the resulting measurements being presented on our internal dashboard. Now, we should take the dashboard seriously, otherwise we would be run over by a train, uh, but not literally. We make the mistake of thinking that the dashboard is the world, or at least that the world looks like the dashboard. Uh, but the world stands to look nothing like the dashboard. And this is plain obvious. It's just difficult to internalize and live your life with this awareness with you at all times. So in the Huxley quote, he, al he also comments on this sort of double-edged nature of language. On the one hand, he calls it a gift because it obviously empowers us in some very striking ways. In many ways, it's one of, one of the defining features of humanity. Um, but it can also confuse us about the nature of reality. So what are your thoughts on how the language faculty can, can confuse us in our ability to distinguish the concepts and abstractions that we're capable of generating versus the actual sort of raw sensory experiences that we have? Nothing about us has ever evolved to enable us to have an accurate worldview. Uh, in other words, to develop accurate philosophy. Uh, nothing, um, everything about us has evolved to allow us to survive for practical, pragmatic purposes. Um, and you may think, oh, that was the case for cavemen, not for us. Well, remember that we think linguistically only for about 30,000 years. Before that, even, even Homo sapiens, anatomically identical to us up to 200,000 years ago, did not have the ability to think symbolically. To, the, to, the, to think conceptually, to develop language, to tell narratives. Those were purely intuitive uh, human beings, anatomic, anatomically identical to us. And we have no idea why this change happened, <laughs> by the way. Um, so we, you know, what we call conceptual reasoning was not even born yesterday. It was born at the blink of an eye ago. Uh, you know, it's, it's last minute. Um, it, it, it hasn't even been born properly yet. <laughs> um, so the consequence is that our inner narrative making has evolved to enable cooperation. Yuval Harari has written extensively about this in his first book. We are fiction creating mammals and our fictions allow us to cooperate with strangers, which other animals don't do. So we can cooperate at enormously large scales uh, with strangers. Now, the 100,000 people who work for GE, 
they are largely strangers to one another. Not, not a single one of them know the other 99,999. Um, yet we have a sort of a, a sort of a shared fictional narrative that allows us to cooperate. Money is a shared fiction narrative. What is a, what is a $10 bill? It's a piece of paper. It's worth nothing. You can't eat it. You can't cover yourself and protect yourself against the cold with it. <laughs> and you can't drink it. It doesn't cure diseases. It's useless. It's, the worth is zero, um, but it's worth $10 because we have a collective fiction, a, a narrative, a fiction, fictional narrative. Um, and believing in that narrative allows us to succeed in life. Um, so that's what our narrative making capacity, our linguistic capacity to tell ourselves what's going on. That's what it's, it's evolved for. It didn't evolve to tell us what's really going on. <laughs> it's evolved to, to give us a convenient fiction in terms of which we can, or on the basis of which we can cooperate and succeed as an animal species on this, this, this ecosystem of planet Earth. So maybe taking a slight detour, um, a, a common turn of phrase that you hear you know, from time to time in life is, you know, someone might say, oh, that, that person is stuck in their head or they have their head in the clouds. And, and what we mean to say when we encounter such a person, sometimes it's even ourselves, is we're sort of stuck in spending too much time in the world of abstraction and metacognition. And it's distracting us from the concrete sensory reality that's, that's right in front of us. And you know, throughout evolutionary history, one of the things implicit in what you were saying is, you know, we must have spent much more of our time every day, some of our uh, ancestors, in the concrete world of direct sensory experience. And as time went on in our lineage, more and more time was spent in this sort of world of abstraction, using sort of that that side of our brain. As a philosopher, as someone who spends so much of of your life living in the intellectual and and in the intellectualizing, living in the world of abstraction. Uh, how do you keep yourself physically grounded? And what are your general thoughts on how that might relate to things like psychological well-being? It, it, to, to do good philosophy is a constant fight to uncover your hidden assumptions and your hidden prejudices. That's what good philosophy is all about. And that requires a certain degree of intimacy with your own mind. You need, you need to be acquainted with the almost infinite uh, uh, set of tricks that mind uses to deceive itself. Because that's what mind does. Mind deceives itself. It's useful for minds to deceive itself, to buy into a certain narrative that is conducive to survival because it motivates you, because it helps you avoid danger, because it gets you the, you know, the healthiest girl around to have healthy children with. Um, but of course, none of this is what you want to do philosophy. To do philosophy, you don't want a convenient fiction. You want to know what's actually going on. And, and, and that process requires digging down into the onion of hidden assumptions, prejudices, and self-deceptive narratives of your own mind. And unfortunately, that's precisely what most analytic philosophers are very bad at. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pursuing this, it's doing this exercise. So for me, um, I, I, I can't even give you a recipe because I am constantly trying to dig into what is the latest subtle way I'm using to deceive myself. And um, I've learned a few things already. I've learned that the most effective deception is a, what I call a two-level deception. The first level is a distraction. Is um, There's a military term for it. Um, when you give your enemy a target, a decoy. A, a decoy. decoy. Yeah. It's when you have a certain narrative that your mind creates about what's going on and you buy into it. And then when you start thinking more carefully about it, you realize, ah, I'm deceiving myself. I'm making certain mistakes here. I will get one up on my own mind. I'll take a step back and I will realize this is all a fiction. Now you take a step back into another narrative. There is always a narrative. And because you found out that the decoy was false, now you are doubly confident that the narrative you now have, the one you stepped back to, back to that now is true. Well, in fact, that one is the real deception. The first one was just a decoy, you know? And, and this may sound curious, at least for most listeners, because not many people engage in this kind of dialectic with oneself to try to, you know, to uncover all the ways your own mind is always trying to cheat you. 
Um, but for me, this is what good philosophy means. It's uncovering that. Mm -hmm. And perhaps this loops back to some of the things we were saying earlier about you know, the fact that our, our brains evolved for survival purposes. So, so related to that, you know, the simple question I want to ask is, why would the mind be trying to constantly deceive itself like this? How does that tie into the evolutionary survival component of this? It's extremely useful to have uh, convenient uh, fictions, to have narratives. Uh, it gives you motivation. It may preempt anxiety. It may be very conducive to social cohesion. It allows you to cooperate with strangers for a common goal. Uh, it gives meaning to your life, gives a reason for you to stand up in the morning and go do something. Because otherwise, if you just think, you know, if one day I will die, so everything is already pointless <laughs> right now, <laughs> right? Because one day it will all come to an end. Um, instead of that, you have a convenient fiction that uh, gives you motivation to stand up, to, 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 to try to be well, to fight illness. And, uh, and be healthy, live long, and have lots of children. Uh, these convenient fictions are very powerful. Look, it's not even only in survival psychology or evolutionary psychology. It's in every aspect of human functioning. Let's take science, which is taken to be sort of the archetypal manifestation of the human quest for the truth, the unbiased objective truth. Convenient fictions are all over science. Um, Newton... Uh, to explain the fact that not only apples fell from trees, but that the moon stayed in its orbit around the earth, he proposed that there is this invisible force acting instantaneously at a distance for no reason. And he called it gravity. And it took the French 50 years to stop laughing of this Newtonian woo-woo, this magical invisible force acting at distances instantaneously. What nonsense was that, right? But that convenient fiction helped us put a man on the moon and an asteroid on a meteor, or, or on, on a, not a meteor, a meteor is when it enters the earth, um, uh, a spaceship on, um, on a, um, oh, my English is failing me now, a space rock of some kind. <laughs> um, um, and then came Einstein, and Einstein said, oh, that convenient fiction was convenient for Newton's time. Uh, but it doesn't account for the orbit of Mercury, and it doesn't account for why I can see certain stars that in fact are behind other stars. So it doesn't account for some anomalies. So we need another convenient fiction. So the new convenient fiction, which is in, in, still the one we use today, is that there is no such force acting at a distance. That's not what gravity is at all. It's not an invisible force. It's the invisible fabric of space-time that bends and twists. That's the new convenient fiction. Um, and now comes loop quantum gravity saying, oh, you know what? It's not even that. <laughs> it's actually something else. So you see science moving through these convenient fictions. Now, the point, if you really understand science, the point is the following. The convenient fictions are really useful. Um, nature behaves as though those convenient fictions were true. So by pretending that they are true, we can predict the behavior of nature and develop technology and improve our lives. And we only change the convenient fiction when new observations show us that the previous convenient fictions are deviating from reality. In other words, nature is no longer behaving quite the way it should if those convenient fictions were true. We need a new convenient fiction. And then we come with elementary subatomic particles, the Higgs boson, which we think is a little particle we measured. Let me tell you the news. We never measured the Higgs boson directly. A Higgs boson has never interacted with a measurement surface. I can explain to you later what this means. But because the convenient fictions are so useful, so convenient, we tend psychologically to think that they are actually true. It's not just an operational convenience to allow us to predict the behavior of nature and develop technology. No, they are really true. And that's where it all goes wrong, not only in science, because the moment sci a scientist makes this assumption, then you get a bad philosopher as opposed to a good scientist. Mm -hmm. um, but in all aspects of human life, we are always dealing with our convenient inner narratives. And when, and when you say that, that these things are useful, all that really means is 
you know, we come up with these fictions. Literally, we make them up. We 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 conjure up these abstractions. Sometimes the one, sometimes these things are very useful, meaning that they predict the outcome of experiments or things that we observe in the natural world, and we call those, you know, our, our good scientific theories. Um, but it it becomes uh, quite easy to lose sight of the fact that on the one hand. You're talking about abstractions that we that we made up, and ultimately their their truth value or or their ability to to be useful and make those predictive uh, th- those accurate predictions. It all comes back to them lining up with our direct sensory experience. When you come up with some amazing theory that predicts the outcome of experiment, at the end of the day, what you're saying is it lines up with what my eyes are telling me when I look at this particular chart, which documents you know something that we've touched directly in some sense. And I think that's an interesting dynamic that that will play off with uh, play the off. Physics of, is a science of perception, and Andre Linde, the great physicist renowned for for cosmic inflation theory, uh, he's on record saying, "Guys, physics is a science of perception. Even if we use instruments like telescopes and oscilloscopes and you know microscopes, whatever, whatever oops you choose, uh, you only see the result of that instrument by perceiving it." So ultimately, everything gets filtered by the screen of perception. In other words, everything that you can possibly know about the world is given to you on the dials of your inner dashboard. They are not the world. They are always filtered and mediated through the screen of perception, through your sensors and your internal dashboard. You always ever only see the dashboard. So before moving on to some of our other big topics, I want to stick with with narratives for a moment. You know, people get very, very attached to narratives. In fact, in, in my experience, it, it certainly seems at least that you know, in the absence of any clear narrative that someone is attached to, um, it can actually cause a lot of distress. And people almost don't know how to organize their behavior without having some kind of narrative script that's running to organize their behavior. What do you think? You know, where do you think this attachment comes from? We'll probably riff off some of the things that you were just saying, but it, it, I mean, is it possible to even exist in the world and behave coherently without running some of these narrative scripts? I don't think it is. I don't think it's even desirable. I think life would become entirely dysfunctional without the narratives. What's important is not to get rid of the narratives. What's important is to understand in the back of your mind that you're always only dealing with internal fictions, with these narratives. It's important to recognize them as narratives, to understand them for what they are. And then also acknowledge the value. Acknowledge that without those narratives, we wouldn't be able to survive. We need them. Um, But if we mistake them for reality, we can go down some very treacherous paths. So I, I would never advocate for the end of the narratives. I think we cannot do without them. Uh, we would lose our humanity if we lost our narratives. What makes us human is the convenient, uh, the convenient fictions, the inner narratives. So by all means, let's not abandon them, but let's see them for what they actually are and keep that in the back of our minds because sometimes it's important to make that distinction between a narrative and what we actually know about reality. Sometimes it's very important. And those times are very, very significant. Like if you want to extract a conclusion about what will happen to you when you die and after you die, it's very important to keep in mind that the narratives are convenient for certain practical reasons, but they are not the reality. So there is a range of usefulness. And if you stretch them beyond that range, you may extract conclusions that are simply not valid or useful at all. Uh, and you may go down a dark hole that you didn't need to fall into at all. So I want to read another quote now. This is from someone who I know is dear to you as a philosopher. And I'm picking this quote also because this was actually part of the inspiration for the logo of the podcast. So I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, to uh, read this quote for people. And I would love if you could comment on this person, how they shaped your thinking, and then we'll get into some of your ideas explicitly. So the quote is, with the disappearance of willing from consciousness, the individuality is really abolished also. And with it, it's suffering and sorrow. I have therefore described the pure subject of knowing, which then remains over as the eternal world I. This I looks out from all living beings 
It is thus identical with itself, constantly one and the same. And this quote is not from a Buddhist monk or something like that, but many people might guess that that's the kind of place it came from. So this was from Arthur Schopenhauer. And so I'd love if you could sort of describe who he was and how that starts to relate to the idealism and the related ideas that you're going to talk about. So this is a quote from 1818, 204 years ago already, by our dear Arthur Schopenhauer, indeed, uh, one of the most recognized names of uh, the Western philosophical canon. Um, I discovered Schopenhauer more or less late in my life. Unlike Jung, who I have known since I was a teenager, Schopenhauer was a late discovery. And, and it was a very sobering discovery because many of the things we talk about in philosophy today, he was already saying over 200 years ago. He sort of, he was way ahead, so much ahead that people didn't understand him. Um, the world's most respected living scholar on Schopenhauer, should I mention his name? Professor Genway, he doesn't have a clue <laughs> what Schopenhauer is trying to say. You can see in his writings about Schopenhauer that he, he has no clue. He accuses Schopenhauer of being a materialist, for instance, while I can quote Schopenhauer saying that materialist is so stupid because it's the philosophy of the subject that forgets himself in his calculations. Um, Schopenhauer derided materialism, uh, but Genway cannot find another way to interpret Schopenhauer's assertions other than under a materialistic framework, because Schopenhauer talked about the brain and the effect that you know, brain function and activity had on the mind, um, seemed to conflate the two at times, say that the mind is the same as the brain, and Genway cannot make heads and tails of that. Um, but things we talk about today, such as cosmopsychism, and you know, cosmic consciousness. Well, Schopenhauer already talked about that. He called it the will with a capital W. Uh, um, um, metacognition, which is, we, we still even didn't manage today to bring that really to the mainstream in neuroscience. A lot of neuroscientists don't understand that. Well, Schopenhauer was talking extensively and very clearly about that over 200 years ago. He called them abstract representations what we call re-representations today, Schopenhauer was calling abstract representations, which are representations of representations. So he already unfolded the whole map of metacognition, higher level mental functions, uh, endogenous cognitive activity, which he called the will, the relationship between that and the phenomena, the world as it presents itself to us, which he called representations, and the world as it actually is, or the noumena, which he called the capital will, which is endogenous from its point of view, he already laid out the, laid out the map for us. But uh, we are too stupid to see it. So why don't you just describe for everyone here? So, so now let's start talking about idealism versus materialism. Maybe a good place to start is actually, could you contrast both of those philosophical ways of thinking with a dualism and then describe how they differ from each other? Okay, so there are, if you add dualism, there are four main um, um, understandings of the nature of reality. Today. We could call them technically ontologies. That's the technical name. Uh, materialism is the notion that the only thing that actually exists, in other words, the only thing that has standalone existence that doesn't depend on anything else in order to exist is matter. Uh, and matter is supposed to be exhaustively defined through a list of numbers, purely quantities. Matter has no inherent qualities. In other words, matter is not blue or yellow or sweet uh, or, or melodious. Matter is just mass, charge, momentum, spin, amplitude, frequency, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's the only thing that exists. And all qualities, mental stuff, the colors, the melodies, the smells and tastes, the feeling of fear, of desire, of having a belly ache, all that's the depression, falling in love, all that stuff can be explained in terms of non-qualitative matter. In other words, can be reduced to matter and therefore mind has no standalone existence. That's what's technically called mainstream physicalism. We can't call it materialism. Now, idealism is the, the opposite of it. Idealism would say all that exists is mental stuff. All that exists is of the same ontological category as your inner feelings. And matter, what we call colloquially matter, which idealism doesn't deny, idealism doesn't deny the existence of 
the things outside of ourselves that we colloquially call matter, but an idealist would say, well, the world we perceive is also qualitative, so it's also mental. So everything, in a sense, is mental. And the challenge for idealism is then to explain why we seem to share the same world, why brain activity correlates uh, with uh, inner experience, uh, uh, why we can't change the laws of nature just by wishing them to be different. So that's idealism. Uh, and then you have panpsychism. Uh, there are many variations, but the main variation says, okay, matter really exists. It has standalone existence. It's not just a kind of experience. The panpsychist acknowledges the fundamental existence of matter. But then he goes ahead and says, but in addition to the other fundamental properties of matter, such as mass, charge, spin, matter also has qualitative properties. In other words, there is something it is like to be an electron. An electron has conscious inner life, very simple, but it has fundamentally a conscious inner life of some sort. And it's the combination of the subjectivities of the fundamental particles making up your brain when they combine, they lead to this, this coherent, seemingly unified conscious inner life that you call yourself. That's panpsychism. And dualism says, there is mind stuff, which is separate from matter. It's not only a property of matter, it's really separate. And it has standalone existence. And there is matter stuff, which is really separate and also has standalone existence. Both exist in themselves and they interact in some form. And that's, of course, the religious view of the soul that inhabits the body. And when you die, the soul floats away like some kind of gaseous substance. <laughs> I don't know. So that's the menu we have. Three of these are entirely incoherent, internally incoherent, and empirically uh, refuted. One survives. So I'm wondering if you could sort of walk us, maybe walk us through your justification for that last last step in a relatively concise way what would you say um what would you say the 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 main the main uh problems the main areas of incoherence are with each of those other three before we get to your discussion of idealism itself the main problems of idealism no, no the, the main, main problems, problems of, of the others uh, of the others okay so let's start with materialism um explanatory power is an issue and uh, materialism fails to explain the qualities of experience in terms of physical parameters. There is nothing about physical parameters in terms of which we could deduce one particular quality of experience as opposed to any other. There is, they are incommensurable. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. Another point of, of difficulty, another incoherence of materialism is that we created those numbers, mass, charge, momentum, frequency, amplitude, we created all that to describe the world of qualities around us, the world we see. Um, so the numbers were there as descriptions. And what materialism does, it then says, what actually exists is only the numbers. It's the description. And the thing described somehow emerges out of the numbers. It's like saying that, you know, you have a territory, you chart a map, and then you say, well, the map precedes the territory, and you try to pull the territory out of the map. Mm. That, that will never work. Um, another problem of materialism is that it assumes that physical entities have standalone existence. But in foundations of physics for the past 40 years, a series of ever more sophisticated experiments have now produced a conclusion being beyond reasonable doubt that physical entities do not have standalone existence. They only exist upon measurement. What we call physicality is the result of a measurement. It's like what is displayed on a dial in the dashboard when the sensors of the airplane measure the world outside. If you don't measure, then nothing is displayed on the dials. In other words, there is no physical world if you don't measure, which doesn't mean that there is no world. There is the thing that is measured. It's just not physical. The world outside the plane that's measured is not the dashboard. That's all it means. <laughs> so this, uh, there are more reasons why materialism is, is stillborn. It's the most incoherent on the table right now. Panpsychism, many problems with it as well. One of them is the combination problem. We have no coherent account of how fundamentally separate fields of subjectivity to, could combine to produce a unified field of subjectivity. Um, there is a strong analytical argument that even to say that this happens is already uh, internally inconsistent. It's incoherent. It doesn't work. Another problem of panpsychism is that it is 
physically incoherent. It contradicts what we know from physics. It assumes that there are these spatially bound elementary subatomic particles that are separated in space and time. And therefore, they combine in one point of space to produce your mind, and they combine in another point of space to produce my mind. And that's why our minds are separate, because the respective subatomic particles forming your brain and mine are separate. The problem is that there is no such a thing as elementary subatomic particles in physics. We have known that since the late 1940s uh, with Richard Feynman and other two gentlemen. Uh, and we, we may be horrified with what I just said, like, what do you mean? Of course they exist. No, subatomic particles are metaphors. Uh, quantum field theory tells us that what exists are 17 quantum fields that are not spatially bound. Subatomic particles are particular patterns of excitation of the fields, like waves in the ocean. They are not fundamentally separate in the same sense that there is nothing to a wave but the ocean. There's nothing to a subatomic particle but the underlying field. And the fields are, uh, span across space and time. So panpsychism fails. And dualism, um, the main reason to reject dualism, I would say, is parsimony. Why do you need two things to explain nature if you can get away with one? That's Occam's razor. It's the principle of parsimony. Another problem of dualism is the interaction problem. If you have two fundamentally different types of things, how come they interact? Because an interaction seems to presuppose a commonality of some form for there to be causal interaction. But if they are fundamentally different, then how, do, how, how is it that you have an interaction? So um, it makes sense to me that, that you would appeal to parsimony there. If you can explain everything with one thing, uh, there's no need to invoke two different things to, to explain the world. So in that sense, materialism is similar to idealism in that both of them involve saying there's just sort of one kind of thing in the universe. So, you know, to, to caricature this a bit, is, is it even worth making the distinction between materialism and idealism? Are they both sort of saying there's one thing at the end? What is the, uh, why is it worth making that distinction between materialism and idealism? Because the implications, <laughs> the implications, sir, are, are, fantastically significant. What materialism says is there is only one kind of thing, and it's not that which you identify yourself with. It's not of the same kind as your, as your inner life. Your conscious inner life is an illusion produced by another kind of thing, and that other kind of thing is the only thing that actually exists. Therefore, when that other kind of thing loses its structural and dynamical integrity, in other words, when you die, then your conscious inner life is gone. And all of your insights, all of your memories, all of your suffering, all of your joy, everything that constitutes that which you identify you yourself with, that which you consider to be yourself, all of that will come to an end and you will vanish into oblivion. But if the one kind of thing that survives is that same kind of thing that you do identify yourself with, then death is a change in your state of consciousness, is a loss of the narrative of individual self. It's like a trance, something fundamental will change <laughs> because, you know, if the body is the image of a certain configuration of mind, if the body is no longer there, then something very big has changed about mind, but it has changed and not disappeared. The real you is still there, um, but its mentation will unfold according to sort of different lines. Um, uh, another reason to think of the implications as fundamentally different um, under materialism, your health, uh, doctors should be like car mechanics. It's a matter of mechanics. So th the only tools uh, uh, available are surgery and drugs. But uh, if idealism is correct, then your body is what a certain dissociated configuration of mentation in nature looks like. Uh, in other words, it's what Schopenhauer would call a representation of the inner will. But the real thing going on is your conscious inner life. Even that, that those aspects of your conscious inner life that are beyond introspection, that are not metacognitive, like your, your repressed emotions, your repressed memories, all that stuff that you never integrated, your fantasies that you don't think you have, you know, your inclinations that you reject and you're ashamed of. All that stuff taken together looks like a human body, a metabolizing human body. So if the body is just what mentation looks like, then you get a third avenue for healthcare, and that's talk therapy, that's psychological therapy. It's, it's to, to put it bluntly, it's to learn how to mature. It's to learn how to reconcile yourself with the facts of nature, the bad and the good, 
<laughs> the good and the bad. So um, you said some things that were interesting there, and I'm wondering if you could reiterate some of them just to tie some of the concepts we've discussed throughout the discussion so far together for people. So you, you said something about you know the death of 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 someone being the end of the narrative of individuation. And you use the word dissociated at one point. So from your standpoint as an idealist, given our previous discussion of dissociation and some of the things you just mentioned, what is, when I perceive you on the other side of the screen here, what what are we from, from your point of view? What am I actually perceiving when I see Bernardo here? So let me, let me try to frame this in the context of what we just talked about and the other ontologies on the table. Let's ignore dualism for now. It's not technically taken very seriously. Um, the three remaining alternatives, constitutive panpsychism, um, analytic idealism, and mainstream physicalism, all three face a canonical problem. They may face more problems, but there is one that is canonical in analytic philosophy. Uh, materialism faces a so-called hard problem of consciousness. There is nothing about physical parameters in terms of which we could deduce the qualities of experience. There is a, there is a chasm there. Panpsychism faces the combination problem. Uh, there is no coherent way of arguing that fundamentally separate fields of subjectivity could, could combine to form a unified field of subjectivity. And idealism faces the opposite of the combination problem. It faces the decomposition problem. And that's the following. Idealists avoid the combination problem by saying that it's all already combined from the beginning. There is only one mind in nature. And that's also the parsimony argument of idealism. Um, we try to explain everything in terms of only one thing, to be as parsimonious as possible. And that one thing is a universal field of subjectivity underlying all nature. Not subjectivity like ours, not higher level mental functions, just, just very simple, instinctive, raw subjectivity, one universal mind, if you will. And then the canonical problem of idealism is how to account for the fact that I cannot read your thoughts and presumably you can't read mine, how to account for the fact that uh, I am not aware of what's happening in the galaxy of Andromeda right now. If everything is happening in one mind, why don't I know your thoughts? Why don't I know what's happening in the galaxy of Andromeda right now? We call that technically the decomposition problem. How what is fundamentally one mind can seem to become many. But unlike the other two canonical problems, nature is shoving under our nose a solution to the decomposition problem, and that's dissociation. There is something in nature that does exactly what the idealist needs it to do in order to tackle the decomposition problem. We know that in nature, minds can seemingly fragment themselves into separate centers of awareness that are co-conscious, can even interact with one another, but don't identify with one another and don't have associative access to each other's uh, private inner lives. So what you're saying is that you know when we, when we see other individuals, indeed when we see other life, we're seeing a dissociated aspect of what is ultimately just one, one substance, so to speak. Exactly. Um, this, uh, like Yolanda Shlum show, showed in 2014, doing fMRI images of people with DID and comparing them to a control group made up of actors pretending to themselves to be dissociated. And she figured out that you could actually discern the two groups based only on the fMRI scans. Um, so there is something dissociative processes look like. Now, just extend that a little further and imagine that, uh, yes, there is obviously a world beyond our individual minds, a world we all share. To deny that is just silly. I'm not a solipsist. I, no idealist is a solipsist. There is a world out there, a real world out there beyond our individual minds. But the idealist will say, but that world too is of the same kind as mind. It is also mental. It's not my mental stuff. It's not your mental stuff. It's transpersonal mental stuff. It's natural mental stuff out there. And then the question is, if that mental stuff undergoes dissociation, should there be something that dissociative process would look like? Well, based on Yolanda Shlom's results, we, we, are, we could infer that there should also be something dissociative processes in nature at large look like. They should be diagnosable and identifiable on the basis of their appearance. And my claim to you is that there is, and it's what we call life, biology, metabolism. What we call life is 
what a dissociative process in the mind of nature, if you will, looks like from our perspective. In other words, when observed from across its dissociative boundary, to, to speak rigorously and technically, matter is what mental inner life looks like when observed across a dissociative boundary. That's why when I look up to the sky, I see a heavens made of matter because I'm observing the heavens from across a dissociative boundary. Which one? My own, my dissociative boundary. Matter is what mentation looks like when observed or experienced from across a dissociative boundary. So um, the image I have in my mind, you know, trying, trying to understand some of your ideas, and I want to try and give people some kind of you know, cartoon model they can try and play with right now. You know, if you imagine just a piece of fa fabric, a loose piece of fabric made out of silk or whatever. If everything is this fabric of consciousness, as you're saying, then you know you and I are just sort of like you know twisted up knots or very sort of complex patterns of folding of that one that one substance. Um, but you know in this in this cartoon example, that would presuppose that there's a spatial extent to that substance to, in order to fold that thing into a knot that looks like Bernardo and into a knot that looks like Nick that can then see each other. There has to be something with spatial extent. So how do you think about concepts of space and time and why, why aren't those sort of the, the priors here? Space and time is woven into our language, into our conceptual armor. It's impossible to speak reasonably without sort of presupposing space and time as, as a scaffolding of the world. Uh, Schopenhauer called it the principium individuationis. Without space and time, everything would occupy the same volume of space at the same time. In other words, there would be no differentiation. Everything would be one. And Schopenhauer said that that is actually what's going on. He followed Kant in saying that space and time are modes of perception, categories of perception. They are not out there. They are just the tricks our mind uses to make sense of the world. They are in the internal scales of the dials on our dashboard. You know, when you have those scales and the dials, the needles of the dials are moving inside the, 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 those little internal scales. That's what space and time is. They are the scales of our, our cognitive apparatus, our mode of cognition, they are not out there. Physics is getting to that conclusion. Loop quantum gravity does away with time as fundamental. Uh, Julian Barbour, 20 years ago, wrote a, 23 years ago, wrote a book called The End of Time, in which he rewrote all the equations of physics, removing T, time, for time. And he showed that physics remains entirely coherent without bringing time uh, into, into the fold. Um, the problem is that, um, Space and time are built into the language. Verbs are actions, actions unfolding time. The distinction between sub, subject and, and, and object is a spatial distinction. So I cannot speak if I, if I am consistent with this view that space and time are not really there. I cannot open my mouth and speak. So what I usually say is the following. Space and time are not really real, um, but what is projected on space and time is not pure nonsense. In the same sense that... Uh, if you illuminate a, a solid three-dimensional cylinder from the front, you will see a circular shadow. And if you illuminate the same solid cylinder from the side, you will see a rectangular shadow. Uh, uh, in the world of shadows, the circle is not the rectangle, right? They are distinct. Um, but you don't dismiss them. The projection of the cylinder in the form of a uh, circular shadow and the projection of the cylinder in the form of a rectangular shadow they do say something about the cylinder, even if the shadows are not primary. What really exists is the cylinder, not the shadows. So what I'm telling you is that what really exists is the world outside space-time, not what we see in space-time. But what we see in space-time are projections of that real world. They are the shadows. And the shadows do say something about the cylinder. So I don't think it is pointless to reason even though reason presupposes space and time in order to have the distinction of categories that reason entails, uh, it is not useless to reason. We just have to keep in mind the fact that we are dealing with projections, with penultimate things and not with ultimate things. Yeah, what you just said reminded me of uh, the famous allegory of the cave from Plato, Yeah, the shadows dancing on the wall. But the shadows perfectly correlate with stuff that actually is out there. Exactly. The shadows and the convenient fictions and the narratives, they are all useful 
I'm, I never advocated to dismiss them. All I am advocating is to keep in mind what the limit of the metaphor is and don't try to stretch the metaphor beyond the limit of usefulness because that will lead you to delusional territory. So one thing I also want to tackle explicitly here is, um, you know, I understand that, that you know, I've, I've read one of your books called The Idea of the World. And, you know, you're coming from a, you know, you would call this analytical idealism. This is a perfectly uh, naturalistic way of thinking um, in your view. But, you know, I think a, a knee-jerk reaction that a lot of people would have to some of your ideas, including myself at a different phase of my life is, okay, well, he's denying that material reality is out there. He's saying that everything is mind and nothing is matter. This must be in some way sort of airy-fairy or involve some element of yeah. supernaturalism. Can you just kind of speak to that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon and there's nothing I can really, there's not, not much I can do to eliminate that. But notice that um, it is materialism that's telling you that the world you experience, the qualities of, the qualities of your experience exist only inside your head, below the inner surface of your skull. Because under materialism, all of your experiences, all qualities, all colors, all flavors, all smells, they are generated by the brain in a way that nobody can explain, uh, but they are supposed to be generated by your brain. Therefore, they only exist inside your skull. If you look up to the sky at night and you see the bright moon, that brightness you see, that experience of seeing the moon is actually unfolding underneath the inner surface of your skull. The real inner surface of your skull is beyond the moon you see in the night sky under materialism. It's all inside your head as far as experiences is, uh, are concerned. There is a real world out there beyond your skull, but that world has nothing to do with colors, with flavors, with smells. It's a purely abstract world that you cannot visualize because it's supposed to be uh, described exhaustively only with a list of numbers. In other words, if you provide a long a lot, enough list of numbers, you will have said everything there is to say about the real material world outside your skull under materialism. So you can't even visualize it. It's pure abstraction. Um, the charge against idealism that it's all airy, fairy mental stuff is based on a misunderstanding of idealism and conflating it with solipsism. Solipsism is the philosophy that the entire world is your personal dream, that all that exists are your personal experiences. That's solipsism. That's very airy-fairy stuff. And we have plenty of reasons to deny that. Um, what idealism says is that, look, there is a real world out there that is beyond my uh, inner mentation that doesn't care what I'm thinking, doesn't care if I like it or not, doesn't care if I wish it to be, it were different or not. It's really an external world in the sense that it's external to my mind. But it is mental, and I grant that inference that it exists as mentation in the same way that I grant that your mentation exists as mentation, even though I cannot access it. I don't know what you're thinking, but I grant that your thoughts exist and they are not mine. In exactly the same way, I grant that there are thought-like processes underlying nature and constituting the external objective world, which present themselves to me as the qualities of experience, but which are themselves not the qualities of my experience. Um, and that, that world is mental, even though I cannot access its mentation directly, just as I cannot access your thoughts directly, I grant the inference that it's really there and that I can perceive it indirectly from across a dissociative boundary. So what people consider to be the unreasonable aspect of idealism, that it's, it's all airy-fairy stuff in your head, that's actually the unreasonable stuff of materialism, because it's materialism that is saying all the world of qualities exists inside your head and inside your head alone. You had this, you had this great line uh, in your book when you're describing what material materialism is in effect saying, and it was something like, um, according to materialism, you're not a ghost in the machine, you're a ghost conjured up by the machine. And I think this is yeah. what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. Under materialism, you don't really exist. Your inner life doesn't really exist. And believe you or not, there are famous materialists who get airtime in mainstream media who state that experiences don't really exist. They are 
illusions, some say, the so-called illusionists, which of course, you know, it, it, it backfires immediately because an illusion too is an experience. So by saying that experiences are illusions, you're actually emphasizing that experiences do exist as illusions, <laughs> but they do exist. And there are materialists of another kind called the eliminativists that they say it's not that the experiences are illusions, it's just that experiences don't exist at all. Now, I don't know how to make heads and tails of that. Experience is the only thing that we can, can be absolutely sure to exist. It's the only given of nature that precedes theory making. It's the one pre-theoretical given. It's what you have before you start you know, creating narratives about what's going on. Um, I think some redundancies is okay here, especially for people that haven't thought about these things as much as you have. But let's, um, uh, let me try and play devil's advocate from a neuroscientist perspective w- with some of these ideas. Um, you, know, you said that today, you know, there's, there's no- nothing that neuroscience can say to explain the qualitative aspect of our experience and exactly how it comes from. But a, a neuroscientist interested in consciousness might say, well, yes, but we can appeal to ignorance here. There's a lot more that we don't know about the brain and other things than we do know. And today I can't explain to you how the brain gives rise to subjective experience, but once we know enough, I'll be able to do that. And I'll be able to tell you that, you know, I can um, inject some pattern of activity into the brain that is sufficient to create some conscious percept. And when we really, really know everything in detail, we'll be able to create arbitrary percepts um, that are composed of different patterns of excitation that we inject into the brain. And likewise, um, you know, when we remove parts of the brain and things like that, certain parts of experience go away. And so can you sort of address that and tie it back to our earlier yeah. discussion of uh, awareness versus meta-awareness? It's important if we want to stay grounded in reality and in reason, it's important that we stay sharp about the distinction between an internal contradiction of a line of thought and an unsolved problem of that line of thought. These are two distinct things. If I'm trying to pull the territory out of the map, it is invalid to say, well, but one day I will create version two of this map and maybe that will still not work, but one day in version N of the map, I will be able to take the territory out of the map. No, you will not, because the problem is more fundamental than one of solving issues. The problem is a fundamental internal contradiction of a certain line of thought. You don't pull the thing described out of its description. In order to have the description, you first need to have the thing described. Um, The hard problem of consciousness is not a problem to be solved in the same sense that to pull the territory out of the map is not something that you can solve in the next version of the map. It just puts you know, right on your face an internal contradiction of the line of thinking that underlies physicalism. Now, of course, committed physicalists um, will always hide behind this kind of promissory argument. It's a sort of hand-waving that you never need to stop making. You can always hand wave your way out by saying, well, but one day we will find enough about this and that and we'll make it succeed. The burden of proof is, is, is not on me. I think this is entirely unreasonable, but if that's what you believe, please go ahead. But then don't turn around and tell me that physicalism is the best substantiated ontology today on the table because you are substantiating it on the basis of all things, ignorance. What you're appealing to, to substantiate your view, is your ignorance, is what you don't know. That's a complete epistemic reversal. You substantiate things based on explicit reasoning and the things that you do know. You don't defend your position by, by appealing to what you don't know. Now, remarkably enough, materialism today stays alive on the back of two epistemic inversions. One is most believers, casual believers in physicalism, do not know what physicalism is. That's ignorance. The other one that is appealed to, and physicalism rests on it today, it is its incompleteness. It's what it doesn't explain. It's precisely its lack of explanatory power. And you would think this is amazing, right? This cannot be what's happening. It's exactly what's happening. Let me tell you why. Because we do not have any idea, even in principle, 
how physical parameters could lead to the qualities of experience. There is nothing about structure and function that can give you qualities. So whatever you learn about the structure and function of the brain, you cannot cross a chasm of incommensurability. No structure and function will give you anything other than structure and function. They will not give you qualities. But because there is so much we don't know about the structure and function of the brain, and there is no account under physicalism of how structure and function or function or, or, or brain activity can lead to the qualities of experience, then we get into a position in which Anything that you measure or fail to measure about the brain can be used as an argument for physicalism because physicalism doesn't tell you what the causal link is. So whatever you see or fail to see, you can always say, no, physicalism survives this because it doesn't, you see, it doesn't precisely tell you, not even imprecisely, it doesn't begin to tell you what the causal link is so you can get away with anything. So whatever you measure, physicalism is still on the table because of the lack of explanatory power of physicalism. And most people on the streets believe in physicalism because they think that physicalism tells you that the world of qualities we experience is really outside your head. No, physicalism actually tells you the opposite. If the regular person on the street would really understand and internalize this, they would go like, how can anybody believe this nonsense? <laughs> So physicalism is now based on ignorance and lack of explanatory power, which is amazing. So, so what you're saying is that the, the hard problem of consciousness doesn't describe a, a problem that can be solved in principle. It describes, it, it's pointing to a contradiction that's largely unacknowledged. And exactly. I said, the hard problem, as it's called, simply evaporates under the paradigm you're speaking of because you're simply saying, well, subjectivity is the one thing that we take as granted. Exactly. The thing described is what exists and matter is a description thereof. We, we stay true to how we began in this 16th century. Uh, what physicalism does, it, it starts from the thing described, the world of qualities. Qualities are all that we have. Then it describes it. And then it says, oh, but the description precedes the thing described. And that leads to this internal contradiction. You cannot pull the territory out of the map. You cannot account for mind in terms of an abstraction of mind, which is matter as defined under physicalism is. Under physicalism, matter is an abstraction. It's something that can be exhaustively, exhaustively defined in purely quantitative terms. Now, there's nothing we are directly acquainted with that is like that, because the mere act of being acquainted with something as a, as a conscious human being entails the existence of the qualities. You're only ever acquainted with qualities. That's what mentation is. So this internal contradiction of physicalism is what we call the so-called hard problem. It's not a problem to be solved. It's just showing us we've taken a wrong turn, retrace our steps back and try another more promising avenue because you're going to hit your wall against this wall, hit your head against this wall forever. And, and physicalists are happy to say that, that uh, one day we will know. That's an appeal to a vague, incoherent unknown. Uh, it cannot be considered a serious defense of any position, let alone a scientific or philosophic position. But in our culture now has made it plausible and acceptable to use ignorance as an argument uh, to maintain a position in life, a position that is clearly uh, a failed, nonsensical, stupid, if I may use the word, I like the word. Materialism is flat out stupid. Look, uh, Nick, during the Enlightenment, when materialism was sort of reified, people knew this. And, and why did they push materialism? Well, listen to what uh, uh, Denis Diderot said, one of the two authors of La Encyclopédie, the founding document of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. Diderot is on record saying materialism doesn't really work, but we need to use it as a weapon against the church. So materialism was a way to carve out a space for science that wouldn't threaten the church. The church was all about the soul. In Greek, the soul is the psyche or psyche, uh, um, and the psyche is mind, <laughs> consciousness. So they invented this world of abstract matter so people wouldn't be burned at the stake like I Bruno see. was. Well, I, I, have, I have no idea about the history here, but what you're saying is there was um, a political move made in the 1600s or so where 
you didn't want to offend the church. So you had to say, well, no, no, everything we're doing over here in the, in the laboratory and in, and in the science department is this it's other nice thing extensive. called the material world. And it has yeah. nothing to do with you, what you're saying, Father. So please don't kill me. <laughs> exactly. Today, we, 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 we learned this in history. We learned that Descartes said, well, the mind is for the church and the material world is for science. And because we are the offspring of, of that misunderstanding, we think, whoa, science got all it needed for itself and it gave the church an illusion. But you have to remember that back in the day, the notion that there is something that is not qualitative in essence was preposterous, almost inconceivable. It was ridiculous. What are you talking about? Abstract matter that you can fully describe with quantities and that doesn't have any qualitative aspect, doesn't have color, doesn't have taste, doesn't have texture. You're, you're delusional. You're hallucinating, right? That's how th people thought. So when Descartes made that move, it reassured the church because, yeah, the church got the entire world. <laughs> you know, it got everything that actually existed. Um, and today we are so sort of duped um, by that cognitive misstep that uh, we learned this in history class and we think, how did the church ever accept this? Now, the scientists gave the church nothing, got away with everything, and the church was so powerful. Why did the church accept this? Well, they accepted this because they thought this meta shit was nonsensical, which it was. And they knew that. They knew matter was just a description. It was not res extensa. It was not a thing in itself. But at some point, somewhere around the middle to the late 19th century, then this major cognitive shift took place. Uh, took place. And uh, Nietzsche uh, eternalized it by saying that that was the moment when God died, the death of God. And, and pe people remember the quote, God is dead. What they don't remember is what uh, Nietzsche said through his mouthpiece, uh, Zarathustra, immediately afterwards. He said, God is dead, and we killed him. Mm. So it was our doing. We reified an abstraction and gave it uh, put it in the pedestal of absolute, ultimate, fundamental, standalone reality. We did that, not nature. We killed God. And from then on, we kept on duping ourselves. And there are psychological dynamics about it. I wrote an entire paper on a major psychology journal explaining what were the psychological dynamics in the intellectual elite of the 19th century that led to this fantastic cognitive inversion to, to this, you cannot describe it with any word softer than pathological inversion. This is uh, because it is so stupid that intelligent people, you would think, could never fall for this, but they did. So you have to account for it in some other psychological term. Not, you cannot assume that those people saw things clearly. They 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 were being motivated by a psychological dynamics that in, we call technically fluid compensation in psychology. You know, it's a whole interview to talk about that alone. But <laughs> Well, yeah. Um, I mean, there's probably a lot we're not going to get to. One of the things I definitely want to get to um, is related to something we, we started to talk about earlier. So in, in your view, in your frame, um, you know, when I look at Bernardo here, I'm looking at a particular pattern of excitation, a dissociated pattern of, of excitation and other people and living things are sort of one class of, of such patterns as distinct from another class of patterns, which we perceive to be non-living things. And this mm -hmm. brings us to the interesting connection that seems to exist between um, abiogenesis or the origin of life, where does living stuff come from in terms of its origin in non-living stuff, and the creation of AI or creation of um, artificial conscious artifacts. And you say in your, your book, the idea of the world, that these two things are connected. And so can you just unpack what you mean by that for people? Yeah, I think we have plenty of evidence to think that other living beings have private conscious in their lives of the same kind we have. I'm sure my cat here lying next to me, uh, people ask me now to show my cat that he <laughs> is. <laughs> if he doesn't appear, people say, oh, where was your cat in that interview? So there he is. Uh, let me just correct the camera. Um, we have plenty of reasons to think living beings have private conscious in their lives like we do. Um, I don't think we have reasons to think that um, a piece of rock has private inner life of its own. 
not least because the separation of the inanimate world into discrete objects is purely nominal. It's something we do by convenience. There is nothing etched in stone in nature that makes the river distinct from the ocean, that makes the car separate from the road, that makes the leg of the chair separate from the rest of the chair. Uh, we nominally, we give names to subsets of this great image we call the inanimate universe because it's handy for communication. I want to buy the car, not the road. So I give a name for a subset of the pixels of that great image. But this carving out of the inanimate universe into discrete objects is purely epistemic. It's we doing this. It's not in nature. In nature, it's one great entangled whole the inanimate universe. We have plenty of scientific reasons to think of the inanimate universe as an entangled system because everything started from the Big Bang, therefore it was all entangled and therefore it cannot decohere with a system around it because there's nothing around it, it's the sum total of everything that exists, so it's still entangled. So it's one whole and objects don't really exist, but living beings do. Because if you touch my hand, I feel it. If you touch my chair, I don't. If a photon hits the wall, I don't see it. If it hits my retina, I do. So there, there is an ontological case to be made for living beings being, in some sense, discrete. There is no case to be made for uh, inanimate objects. So there is no case to say that a rock or a computer has a private conscious inner life of its own, because all instances of private conscious inner lives that we know share this feature called metabolism. They all metabolize. A computer doesn't. Now, does that mean that we can say for sure that a computer is not conscious? No, but I cannot say for sure that there isn't a teapot in the orbit of Saturn. Maybe ETs came here in the 19th century, stole a teapot, went back to, I don't know, the Pleiades and emptied their waste bin around the, the midway through the Pleiades, and then that waste got captured in the orbit of Saturn, and therefore there is a teapot in the orbit of Saturn. So I can't disprove that, but is it interesting as a hypothesis? No, because we have no reason to entertain the hypothesis. So in exactly the same way, I think we, we have no reason to entertain the hypothesis that a computer can ever be conscious. Look, we never make this mistake when it comes to other aspects of nature. Um, that's the kidney function. You probably heard me use this metaphor before. Uh, I can simulate kidney function accurately on my iMac in front of me with an M1 processor, I can simulate kidney function down to the molecular level accurately on my iMac. That doesn't mean that my computer will pee on my desk because the simulation of a phenomenon is not the phenomenon. It's a simulation thereof. They are similar only at an abstract level not at the level of the medium that gives the phenomenon its actual existence. But when it comes to consciousness, we think that the computer will be on our desk, that if we emulate the patterns of information flow in a human brain, in a computer, the computer will be conscious. Now, that's exactly as absurd as to say that a simulation of kidney function will make my computer urinate on my desk. Again, it's stupid. It's one of those stupid mm -hmm. things that the mainstream media has manufactured plausibility for. We now think it's plausible because we watch science fiction and have been watching science fiction for decades that tells us that this could be the case. And we have bozos with PhDs earning a living in the lecture circuit by wooing people with the woo-woo of artificial consciousness. <laughs> anyway. so, so if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is if and when we do in fact create um, artificial intelligence, um, some form, some conscious artifact, it will not look like uh, a very fancy laptop that's capable of reporting uh, amazing uh, simulations or calculations to us. We would actually instinctively perceive it to be an alien life form, an actual biological life form. Yeah, look. Um, how will I put this best? I don't think we have any reason to think that when we create an entity with private conscious in their life, like we do, that it will look anything other than biology. Now, when we talk about creating consciousness, what we mean is creating private consciousness, because that's the consciousness we know. We want to create something like us, and we have private or dissociated conscious in their life. So that's what we are talking about when we talk about artificial consciousness, is the creation of private conscious in their life. 
will we ever be able to do that? I think we will. I think we will be able to induce artificially dissociation into this fundamental field of subjectivity that underlies all nature. But when we succeed in doing that, when we succeed in artificially creating a privately conscious being, it will look like biology. I think we have every reason to think that that will be the case and no reason to think that computers will do that. You can only think that you can do that with computers if you fantastically ignore the medium. In other words, if you ignore the actual thing and you choose only abstractions to exist, which it is, it's completely arbitrary. There is no reason to do that. Um, but I look, I distinguish this from artificial intelligence. Intelligence is objectively measurable. If uh, uh, an artificial entity can solve certain problems uh, intelligently in a way that we would recognize as intelligence, that would pass an IQ test, then you can certainly say that that computer is intelligent. I think we will get to general artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, AGI, which is human level or more intelligence in a computer. Do I think that will happen? I'm quite confident that that will happen. I worked in artificial intelligence for years. Uh, it will happen, but it will not have a conscious inner life of its own in the way you and I have. Mm. In other words, we don't need to pass laws protecting the rights of intelligent computers. And let, let's drop that nonsense, okay? <laughs> so earlier, um, you, you mentioned, you know, I, I read the Schopenhauer quote, and you mentioned that that was a thinker that came to you late in life. You mentioned Carl Jung, who is someone you've known throughout your entire most of your life. Um, and for me, with respect to Jung, it's actually the opposite. I remember learning about Carl Jung in grade school and psychology class. And based on my own temperament, I just sort of ignored it, right? It was archetypes of the collective unconscious, dream analysis. It sounded like nonsense to me. So I just sort of never went there. I never read Jung until I was in my 30s. And I read Jung um, not that long ago in my life for the first time directly. Um, as a primary, you know, reading young directly rather than reading secondary sources. And, you know, my background's in neuroscience and in evolutionary biology. So, you know, that's, that's generally the frame that I bring to the table when I'm, when I'm reading something and thinking about things. And I was struck when I read one of Young's books that a lot of what he appeared to be saying when he was talking about things like archetypes and the collective unconscious, it struck me that it, it sounded a lot like the types of things I or others with uh, an evolutionary psychology background might talk about. He just was using a very different vocabulary, but many of the things that I originally assumed were sort of fantastical or even supernatural were perfectly naturalistic, it seemed to me. When he was talking about archetypes, I, in my reading, it was just that we all have brains. We all descended from a common ancestor. So all of the structural and functional similarities that we have will mean that even though the specific individual contents of our experience are different because we're all distinct individuals, we're all going to show the same basic patterns because we all inherit those things from this common architecture that we got from our evolutionary antecedents. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about Carl Jung and the idea of archetypes and, and what that has meant to you. Um, Anthony Stevens has sort of perpetuated now this notion that Jungian archetypes are genetic inheritances. I think if you read Jung, you immediately see that that's not at all what he meant. Uh, you have to read more than just you know one chapter of one book in order to realize that. But if you read his corpus, it's obvious that's not what he meant um, when he and Wolfgang Pauli, the, the famous physicists, you know, the, the, the Pauli exclusion principle is named after him. He was Jung's friend and patient. And together they developed the hypothesis of synchronicity. And what's entailed by that hypothesis is that the same archetypes that manifest themselves th through the human mind manifest themselves through the physical world at large. So the archetypes for Jung cannot be a genetic inheritance. That's plain obvious. And I don't know why Anthony Stevens sort of ignored what Jung wrote in order to try to accommodate Jung to a certain limited mainstream perspective, while Jung himself <laughs> didn't try to do that at all. Um, but so just to comment on what you said about you know, the, mm -hmm. this genetic inheritance aspect, I think Jung went much further than that. But um, the existence of archetypes are an implication of the falling hypothesis. To be is to have properties. Mm. 
if you think that this is correct, that to be is to have properties, then archetypes follow. Because if you are, then there is something you are and something else that you are not. To be is to be one thing and not another thing, right? Um, that means that to be is to have properties. And therefore, the behavior of the thing that is, is determined by the properties. What you do is determined by what you are. That's entirely plausible, right? So, if you are, you behave according to certain patterns and regularities. Why? Because you are what you are. And those pattern regularities are what they are because you are what you are and not something else. If you were something else, then you would have other patterns and regularities of behavior. But because you are the thing you are and not something else, then you have these patterns of regularities of behavior. Those patterns of regularities of behavior are the archetypes. So whatever the mind is, by being what it is, or by virtue of being what it is, it behaves the way it does. And it doesn't behave in another way because it isn't something else. It is what it is. To be is to have properties. To be is to behave archetypally. So the question now is, is what are the archetypes? Not are there archetypes? No, of course there are archetypes. There are patterns of behavior. Everything that behaves has to exist. And to exist is to have archetypes of behavior because you are what you are and not something else. So you behave in that way and not in some other way. So Jung's quest was to try to catalog as many of the archetypes of mind, including the collective unconscious. And Jung was very clear. He said, I am not against equating matter itself, matter at large, not only the matter in your brain. I am not against equating, equating matter with the psyche as long as by psyche, we mean the collective unconscious. So for Jung, the collective unconscious was the mind of nature that presents itself to our observation as the physical world. And because it is mental, it has mental archetypes. And those mental archetypes, as they express themselves, can be cataloged in the form we call the laws of physics, the laws of nature. They are the regularities of the behavior of nature uh, that, uh, that are available to observation because they are the expressions of the archetypes of nature's mind. And they are what they are because nature is what it is. And it needs to be something. So it needs to behave in certain ways. And that's what we catalog and call the laws of nature. So for Jung, the archetypes of the human psyche are instances of the same archetypes as those described by the so-called laws of nature, which are not laws at all. They're just metaphors to describe certain regularities of behavior in nature. And that's why sometimes the world, it, the actions of the world correspond to your inner conscious life, what he called meaningful coincidence or coincidences or synchronicities. This correspondence exists because according to him, the world at large in your mind, they are both expression, expressions of the same underlying mental archetypes. Interesting. So, did, I mean, did Jung consider himself an idealist explicitly or, or would no, you simply no, he was, infer that about him? Yeah, it's very easy to infer. So Jung, especially in the first half of his career, he tried to stay as far away as possible from the label philosopher as he possibly could. If you read his autobiography, you see that uh, he was a philosopher since his teens. He started reading Kant and Schopenhauer uh, and, and Goethe when he was 14, 15. He stole the books from his father's library without his, his father knowing it. Um, but um, in the, in early in his career, especially after the break with Freud, he was sort of insecure. He wanted to carve out a place in that community for himself. So he steered away from the notion that he was philosophizing. He, he presented himself as an empirical scientist. He, under, he underpinned the hypothesis of the collective, collective unconscious based on the clinical data, which is the empirical observations of the psychologist. It's clinical data. Um, but if you read his entire corpus, you see that he makes a, an abundance of statements that have direct philosophical implications. And then in the second half of his career, he dropped that pretense that he wasn't doing philosophy. And at some point he wrote 
that, uh, yeah, okay, I admit, not in these words, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, philosophy and psychology are so intricate, intricately interrelated that uh, it's impossible for me to say that I wasn't doing philosophy. I, what I'm doing is really at heart philosophy. And if you then read what he wrote in terms of philosophy, he was flat out an idealist. There is no denying that. There is a letter he sent to Father White, Father Victor White, one of his friends. He was a Catholic theologian. And in that letter, Jung is, in an effort to be as ambiguous as possible, he chose a word in Greek because that was the only language in which that word was fundamentally unambiguous and left no room for discussion. He said, the psyche is an usia. And an usia, it's a Greek word that means that which has standalone existence, that which is not reducible, a substance, an essence, the thing in itself, a noumenon. It's completely unambiguous. So he said, the psyche is irreducible. And that's an idealist speaking. So at least in the West, we tend to associate religions, especially the big monotheistic religions with dualism, where there's this separation between material stuff and spirit stuff or, or whatever. Um, but various religious and spiritual traditions have come to essentially idealistic conclusions through introspective practice stating, like you, that there's just one universal mind. Uh, do you have a perspective on any traditions or texts that provide perhaps the most cogent articulation of idealism in, in their terms? Well, non-dualism, uh, the interpretation of the Vedas that you find in the Upanishads, uh, it's difficult to argue that <laughs> that's not uh, flat out idealism. It's of course idealism described in a metaphorical language because that's how people used to think three, uh, one and a half thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, the, the notion of speaking literally is a very recent notion. It's a Western uh, creature uh, and a young one. Um, so people spoke always metaphorically, but if you can see through the metaphors, uh, the Upanishadic interpretation of the Vedas uh, is, is clearly a, a non-dual, non-dualistic form of idealism. Idealism is fundamentally non-dualist. But I would argue that even Christianity, if you are not you know, a fundamentalist or a literalist, uh, even in Christianity, uh, the Holy Spirit percolates through the entire universe. And the Holy Spirit is the same thing as Jesus, and it's the same thing as the Godhead. They are not separate things. So it's not like there is God in the form of Jesus and a separate Holy Spirit. No, they are all members of the Trinity. They are all one, three aspects of one. And in the whole, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, which is that one, it percolates through everything. It's in every honest man, child, and woman. Uh, and the, the descent of the parakeet, I think, is, is the part of Christianity that talks about that. So uh, I would say even in Christianity, uh, especially if you look at the Gospel of John, uh, in which he talks about Jesus as the Word. And you know, the Word, the Greek word that we translate as Word, is logos. And logos stands for mentation in Greek. Uh, so when John talks of Jesus, God, being the word, what he's saying is that God is the logos. God is mentation. God is mental activity. And in, in, the, in the metaphor of the Holy Spirit, that mental activity percolates through all reality. If you have the eyes to see, all of the great religions will be pointing at idealism. So... One of the other things I want to touch on, in part because I've had many conversations about this subject, although probably not in the way that, that we'll discuss it, is uh, psychedelics. So psychedelics have become much more culturally prominent recently. They've been sort of revitalized in certain ways. There's lots of interesting um, scientific research going on with them. But you know, as people know, either from direct experience or from reading about other people's direct experience, you know, psychedelics are very interesting and powerful effects on the contents of consciousness. Oftentimes you take a, a psychedelic, especially at a high dose, and you experience things that you didn't even know were on the menu before. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the phenomenology of psychedelics in connection with some of the things we were talking about earlier. Um, what are we learning about what's going on in the brain when someone ingests a psychedelic? And how does that start to relate to some of the things we were talking about previously in terms of the uh, the reducing valve uh, that the brain access, to, to use Huxley's term. 
So you want me to talk about the phenomenolo phenomenological side of things, not the neuroscientific side of things. If, well, well, why don't we uh, why don't we try and take them uh, uh, in sequence there? So, so okay, okay. what kinds of so, things tend to happen in a psychedelic experience, and then how does that tie to some of these neuroscientific findings? Yeah. I've done many psychedelic experiences and I consider myself lucky to have only started doing them when I was already in my thirties as a mature adult. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know what I would have made of it. I, I'm not sure they would have been productive and useful. Uh, they're certainly not for fun. It's a hard curriculum. It's hard work. It's not something you do for fun. And if you do that for fun, then you're not really doing it. And you're taking a very light dose if you think you can go to a concert after taking psilocybin. So you don't know what a real psilocybin trance is if you're doing it that way. Um, I've done a few. Um, that doesn't give me the right to say that I know the, tru the, the truth about psychedelics. Because once you've been there, you know that that's an infinite world. But um, my takeaways are the following. There is a lot, a lot, a lot more about my own inner mentation. A world of rich imagery rich cognitive associations, rich feelings, uh, rich imagination that is completely beyond metacognitive access in an ordinary state of consciousness, stuff that I do not know I have in me. And I would never have known if I hadn't done a psychedelic trip. I would only have known that during the process of death, which does the same thing psychedelics do, reduce and impair brain activity. Um, so a lot more has been revealed to me explicitly about my own inner fantasizing, my own inner uh, needs that are fulfilled through fantasy, uh, my own inner yearnings, uh, how much I love certain people, for instance, becomes very evident. Uh, what I actually yearn for in my life, as opposed to my little egoic plan of the achievements I need to have in the coming 10 years. Psychedelics show you what you really, really want, um, how you really, really are from within, how you really, really feel. And much of this stuff is stuff that we rather not know. We don't want to know that stuff about ourselves. It makes us feel inappropriate or ashamed, makes us fear ourselves. There is a monster within, and, and psychedelics can show you that monster as well. So that's one. The other thing I think it showed me is that uh, certain aspects of the psychedelic experience are way too alien to be mine. They aren't mine. Are they fantasies? Yes, but they are not my fantasies. They are the inner mentation of the field of subjectivity around me. They are the noumena. They are part of what nature is in essence, as opposed to how nature presents itself to me through my sense organs. They are the thing in itself, part of the thing in itself. And the thing in itself going on out there is weird. You know, it, it, to, to, it's the difference between to perceive nature and to be nature. And psychedelics give you a hint into what it is to be nature beyond yourself, what it is like to be nature just beyond just yourself. And it's mighty weird. And at the same time, extraordinarily familiar. And that's a, a very characteristic cognitive dissonance in a deep psychedelic trance, that the thing that is most alien, most anxiety-inducing, most discombobulating, at the same time, it's the thing that's closest to you, the most familiar, the most primordial, that which you knew at the very beginning of time and you've forgotten that which is the real you, and at the same time, so incredibly alien. Now, that stuff is not mine as Bernardo Castro. That stuff is the recognition of nature's mind through my cognitive apparatus, but that stuff is not me. And, and, and you, may, you may ask me, well, how do you know it's not you? Well, go there yourself. Come back and tell me that that stuff was you. It surpasses any conceivable notion of a personal self. It surpasses all of our categories, all of them. So that's the second thing. And the third takeaway message, and the most important, um, in my opinion, uh, from my psychedelic experiences, is that mind concocts its own sense of reality. You can be in a psychedelic trance and in that trance you are in the Pleiades talking to aliens and you have a feeling of hyper-reality. You cannot help but tell yourself, this is actually happening. It feels so much more concrete, vivid, self-consistent, 
continuous, reliable, palpable than ordinary reality. It feels much more real than real. It's what people usually say. You know, if you have your friends trip, they come back saying, wow, man, far out. That was more real than real. Yes, that's the sense. But were you physically in a reality outside mind, talking to aliens in the play it is outside mind? No, you were not. If somebody were next to you, you would be lying on that bed all along. So what tells you is that our sense of reality is not objective. It doesn't come from outside mind. Our sense of reality is endogenous. Therefore, the real insight from the psychedelic trance is not that the trance is real in the sense of being outside of mind. It's not. It's a creation of mind. But what it's telling you is that this right now is a creation of mind as well. That your sense of reality right now, your feeling of the continuity, the, 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 um, the fact that the world seems to be autonomous and, and independent of your willing and your wishes, all this stuff that seems to ground our sense of reality, that's all mental stuff too. It's not your mind as an individual human being, but this too is mental. This too is a kind of trance. We are on drugs all the time and you don't need to be on trance only in psilocin or dimethyltryptamine. You can have a trance on um, uh, our main neurotransmitter. Talk about glutamate? No, serotonin. no, no. Serotonin. <laughs> we are <laughs> tripping on serotonin right now. So no, we are always on drugs. So this too is a kind of trip. I think that is the key takeaway message from the psychedelic trip. Not psychedelic gnosis, not to come back and say, I spoke to a real deity outside mind. No, 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 no. Don't get taken in by your own bullshit. Because under, under, under psychedelics, you have no defense against your mind's perpetual attempts to deceive itself. Mm -hmm. That's what mind does. Mind communicates to itself by creating deceptive imagery. It's the language of mind. It's what it does because it is what it is. So you're not escaping that in a psychedelic trip. But what you can conclude is, shit, that's what mind is doing right now. And so there's some interesting uh, results that have, you know, started to, to, to percolate up into uh, our awareness around what the brain is actually doing in the psychedelic state versus uh, the normal waking state. What are some of the more interesting findings that you've seen so far and how does that tie back into some of our discussion? Of the most robust and, and large, the largest uh, observation so far, which is, uh, has been repeatedly observed across psychedelic substances and across measurement apparatuses. And by substances, I mean studies were done with psilocybin, which turns into psilocin, uh, DMT, LSD, ketamine, and I think a couple of others. But the main studies were made with these four substances, and measurement apparatuses were fMRI, MEG, and EEG. So a variety of substances and a variety of measurement apparatuses have led to the same conclusion, psychedelics always and only reduce brain activity. They don't increase brain activity beyond the error margin of measurement anywhere in the brain. That's the largest effect of psychedelics. There are other very minor effects as well, which the literature is now focusing on because they, they sort of remain consistent with physicalist intuitions. Um, but the main effect is the opposite of what we would have expected. You know, before 2012, you would have asked any neuroscientists, what do psychedelics do in your brain? Everybody would say, oh, they light up your brain like a Christmas tree, you know? Both levels would go beyond the charts, you know, you would be consuming a lot of oxygen in your brain because it would be lit up in order to generate the imagery of the trance, which is the richest, most intense, most significant experiences of one's life. Actually, uh, research done at um, 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 I'm failing with remembering the details, but research has shown that uh, it consistently scores amongst the five most intense, rich, memorable, significant experiences of one's life. One psychedelic trance, let alone a whole series of them. And we thought, you know, the brain lights up like a, like a Christmas tree. It's the opposite. Your brain is less active than when you're dreaming, a lot less active than when you are asleep. Uh, it is the best, safe, model of death we have in the sense that it really brings your brain activity down without killing you. And then you get metabolic rebound after now, after you metabolize uh, the, the, the substance 
you know, then blood oxygen uh, levels in the brain increase a lot because your brain is starved. Um, but that's the main, the main, by far the largest and most consistent effect, reduction of brain activity. Yeah, and, and it's it's a very interesting um, observation. It's also, I think, interesting to think about in terms of this connection between the psychedelic experience and death that many people have drawn um, throughout time. And you know, one of the one of the uh, particular psychedelics I wanted to ask you about, based on one of my own experiences, was five methoxy DMT. So I'll briefly describe an experience I had and and how I start to connect some of the dots here. And, you know, when I had this experience, um, which I spoke about in the very first episode of the podcast, it was not the first psychedelic I'd ever tried. I had been very experienced at this time, but 5-MeO-DMT had a very different character to it than anything else I had tried. And very briefly, I'll just say that for the tens of minutes that you're in this trance, it leads to what I would describe as a very undifferentiated uh, experience, meaning that as opposed to taking other doses of other substances, instead of seeing a bunch of crazy stuff and things are moving and things are happening, everything goes away. And yet somehow there is still this awareness present. And so, you know, with eyes closed, it's sort of just dark. And with eyes open, it was a pure white light. And you just immediately kind of have this undifferentiated experience of light. There are no shapes, there are no concepts, there's no there's no mental activity happening except the sort of what I would just call pure awareness. And then as you relax out of the state, that light starts to coalesce into simple colors, and then they start to sort of morph and move a little bit. And then gradually over the course of 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, it coalesces into what eventually just becomes you looking at the room again in the normal way that you do. But the first experience I had with it, my when I started thinking again, uh, tens of minutes of li- uh, later, um, I, my mind immediately went to, wow, that sounds a lot like every time I've heard someone describe a near-death experience and they say, I saw the light or something like that. Or anytime I've heard you know, uh, someone really into Buddh- Buddhism or meditation say, uh, talk about samadhi or the sort of pure, undifferentiated state that you can reach, at, which is usually taken to be the, the kind of pinnacle, pinnacle of, of meditative practice. And it struck me that I had this sort of undifferentiated experience. All of the distinctions, all of the concepts, all of the colors, all of the shapes went away temporarily. And I was just left with this pure and very, very strong feeling of bliss is maybe the best word that you could use to describe it. And it was very interesting. I would love to know what's going on in the brain, but I wonder if 5-MeO in particular is causing these kind of reductions in brain activity. And before I get your comment on this, Bernardo, I do want to tie that back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, where a lot of what the brain is doing when it's metabolizing and doing what the brain does, it is drawing distinctions between things. It's making sensory discriminations. It's building the concepts that allow us to label and discriminate between different entities that we perceive as as objects and other things. And all of that goes away in this particular experience. And, you know, I would love to get your comment on that or, or hear about any experience you might have with 5-MeO. I didn't have any experience with, with uh, 5-MeO. No. Um, the frog business <laughs> is not appetizing for me. I don't know whether you can get that synthesized uh, legally in the Netherlands. The, only in a research context, I would imagine. Um, I'm not sure about the Netherlands in particular, but depending on the jurisdiction, um, yeah, there is there is synthetic 5-MeO DMT, and it sometimes is available for research purposes, and sometimes it's available for anyone. I, I never tried 5-MeO. Um, I did have an experience of the, the smell is the same as what you just described, but I had that experience with psilocybin. Mm. Psilocybin is 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 a, a strange psychedelic in the sense that you, you never know what's going to come. It it can be radically different from one week to the next, from one phase of your life to another. But there was one experience I had with psilocybin in which uh, I I came back and the the only word, the only cultural reference I had that would get anywhere near what I had experienced was uh, the Buddhist void, the void of Buddhism in which there is only mind, but mind isn't excited. In other words, there's only potentiality, but there's nothing beyond that. 
And I was in that void. And it's a very non-claustrophobic void in the sense that it's uh, unlimited. It's not constrained by space and time at all. It's a, it's a moment of eternity, if one wants to put it that way. Um, and when I started coming back from that, which I usually call the re-entry, um, the re-entry from that particular experience was the worst aspect of a psychedelic experience I have ever experienced. Uh, people talk about, you know, the, the lift off, which is ego dissolution. That can be very hard, but you grow into it. You become used to it to a point that it, it doesn't feel bad at all anymore. You're so ready to let go of all of your shit that when it goes, you don't grasp onto it. You don't try to hold on to it. So I got to a point where I was used to ego dissolution and didn't feel bad at all. On the contrary, it felt like a great relief. You know, it's letting go of all of your anxieties, all of your problems. It all dissolves, dissolves, dissolves. Only what is really important and really real stay. Um, but the re-entry from this particular experience of the void, I don't know even how to describe that. It, imagine you're being crushed by a truck, except that this this truck is as heavy as the moon and it's crushing you for a hundred thousand years and you're not dying. Um, the level of claustrophobia of reconnecting with the notion of time. Uh, I remember having the image of a calendar with the five days of week of the week and the two days of weekend. I, I, I remember re coming back to that image and thinking, my God, no, I cannot live ruled by this little thing called the weak. My life, my existence cannot be ruled by this. This is so incredibly claustrophobic. claustrophobic. You, I couldn't breathe. And, and I had these images coming back. Um, I drive a, um, a black Volkswagen Passat, you know, a large sedan, totally black. Um, and I had this image of this little thing that was me inside the black box. And it needed to be in that black box to have different experiences. In other, in other words, to go from one place to another. So you, you couldn't have different experiences by just allowing experiences to flow through you. You had to, to get into that little black metal box. And that was so crushing and so crushing as well. <laughs> um, it took me, I don't know, two or three days to accept life again after that. Hmm. Because I was, when I came back to this, I was so crushed. I was so depressed. I was so um, irate with the notion of being alive. Like inside this little box in space and time that I was dysfunctional for a couple of days. And that was one of the trips that sort of sobered me up. Like, oh, I have to be careful with this stuff. The curriculum is very hard. This is no joke. These are hard life lessons and they are as hard as they come. It's very tough love. <laughs> what, what kind of dose was that with? Uh, between five and six dried grams. Of, okay, so you did uh, you did the teacher. heroic dose. I've, I've done more. I've done eight. Wow, that that's quite a lot. So one of the things I do want to talk about here is, but um, I'm very hard headed, uh, Nick. Eight for me probably is four for mm -hmm. the regular tripper. Uh, my, my 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 baseline consciousness is very hard to move. It's very hard to displace it. Hmm. Um, so one of the things I do want to talk to you about is. The, the phenomenology of death and, and how you think about it, given the frame that, that you think in. Um, so I want to say, you know, one of the things I've talked to people about before is my 5-MEO experience. And one of the ways I start to think about that myself, but also help other people think about it who haven't had the experience is, is in the following way. And, and again, naturally, I think as, as a biologist. So an experience we've all had is going out on a cold day. You're not wearing a jacket and it's very cold outside. What happens as you walk outside and time passes? Well, some parts of your body start to get pain and start to get very cold and start to get frostbite before other parts, right? So your body has baked inside of it an order of operations that happens. It knows, okay, well, if we only have so much heat to keep the body alive, 
make sure that your brain and your heart and your organs get that heat um, and you know, siphon it away from the tips of your fingers, the tips of your toes, the tips of your nose first. So the body knows, so to speak, and it will, uh, it will allow the least important things for survival to shut off first and preserve the ones that are absolutely essential as long as it can. So when we think in that way and we think about metabolism, now think about the brain just decaying organically as part of a slow and gradual natural death process, right? Some parts of your brain and the brainstem are controlling your heartbeat. They're controlling your breathing. If those go offline, you're done. But all of the fancier stuff, so to speak, that your cortex is doing, creating your ability to have language, to discriminate objects based on the sensory inputs you're getting, to make logical deductions, all of this stuff is not strictly necessary. You can lay there and breathe and keep your heart beating without doing those things. And so I wonder if, you know, in the, in the organic death process that people experience in old age, I would suspect and it's answerable in principle, right? That those higher order networks in the brain doing the fancier stuff are going to shut down first. And the things that will generally shut down last, if you're having this kind of slow death, are the ones that are absolutely essential for respiration and heartbeat and things like this. And if that's the case, and if, if what much of those higher order networks are doing are all of this fancy stuff that we take for granted, us talking together, making distinctions between objects in my visual field and so forth, Doing science be, and philosophy. <laughs> and science and philosophy. All of those things would start to go offline while the absolutely essential survival functions were preserved. And you would eventually, perhaps, I think, come to some experience not unlike what I and what you just described, where things feel void, but the brain is still alive for some period of time. And you know, I, I've always wondered and speculated if things like 5 MEO or things like these high dose psilocybin experiences are essentially putting your neurophysiology into a place that's not unlike what it does when things organically wind down at the time of death. And, and perhaps that's related to why many near-death experiences um, have these similarities to the types of experiences people have on psychedelics. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that and then just talk about death from the perspective of analytical idealism. I think what you said is entirely reasonable and it doesn't sound uh, implausible at all uh, to my ears. I mean, a, psych a psychedelic is not a threat to your life like code is. So it's curious why they have this effect, why they reduce brain activity as if you were dying. So I'm not sure why that happens that way, but, but clearly it does happen. Um, and I do think it's uh, it's the best safe model of death we have. Um, I mean, sh sh short of going to like the flatliners did in the movie that you stop your heart <laughs> and hope to be resuscitated with psychedelics, your heart never stops, uh, but your brain largely does. And that's a good model of death. Now, from an analytic idealist perspective, um, the normally function metabolizing body and brain, ordinary brain activity, all these things are what a strong dissociative process in the mind of nature looks like. Uh, so they're directly correlated. One is the appearance of the other. And of course, be, you know, be, life wants to survive. That's, that's, that's what evolution tells us, that the organisms that we have today are the ones that are best capable of staying alive. And uh, so in, in the language of analytic idealism, it's a natural thing that alters once formed want to survive. They want to stay as alters. Why? Because you know, the, 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 the causal nexus of nature would favor the alters that do, <laughs> as opposed to the alters that don't. It's not like there is a, a, a law decreed by some agent in nature saying it this shall happen thus. No, it's just what happens to happen. And we understand why it happens like that. Um, now, if an ordinary, normal, healthy, metabolizing body and brain are what a dissociative process looks like, then death, the end of that body and brain, is what the end of dissociation looks like. So, Right, if if the body is the image of dissociation, and the end of the body implies <laughs> logically uh, the end of the dissociation. Now, how would that feel phenomenologically from a first-person perspective? We think that death implies the sort of the end of consciousness. Um, 
Uh, but we know now that many of the states which we consider unconscious are not unconscious at all. Syncope is not unconscious. You can have rich visual imagery during the time you are unresponsive, um, psychedelics, trance states, the choking game. I mean, the list is endless um, that we know that uh, states in which we are unresponsive uh, are accompanied by rich, rich inner life. So I think the same applies to death. Uh, because death is the end of the dissociation from a first-person perspective, what is experienced is an enrichment. Um, you cognitively reassociate with your immediate cognitive environment uh, from which you were dis dissociated just before death. Um, and to put it in colloquial language, you remember things you didn't know anymore. You will have a sense of identity that spans a much larger area than just your body. Um, uh, your inner imagery will become a lot richer than your living human fantasizing could ever be. Um, it's a reintegration into a broader cognitive context, which could be experienced as something overwhelming. Imagine if you remember the memories of the universe <laughs> coming from being a little human being. Of course, it won't, it won't last long. It's like waking up. Waking up is the end of a dissociative process. When you wake up, your dream avatar is toast. It's dead. And, but it's the same you. It's just that you thought you were the dream avatar, but you never were. It's the same you that wakes up. And then you remember the memories of your life, which you didn't remember when you were the dream avatar. Uh, you were dissociated from the aspects of your mind that did the rest of the dream and had the rest of your memories and ideas and wishes and fears and fantasies and all that good stuff, which all comes back to you the moment you wake up. I would expect death to be something like that to the power of, I don't know, 100. In other yeah. words, it's scary stuff. <laughs> I'm, I am yeah, afraid. I mean yeah, I mean, even the term ego death that people use in the context of psychedelics, you know, sort of gets at how how jarring the experience can be. You know, if, if you're coming up on a large dose of psilocybin, you know, ego death corresponds basically to some patterns of activity in the brain that are associated with your feelings of individuation, and those are going away. And, and a lot of people experience that as, oh, my body is actually dying, even though it isn't in fact dying. And it can be frightening if you if you try and, and fight it. Uh, and it can have this very liberating feeling if you just sort of relax into it. And I wonder if, you know, a lot of the metaphors that we typically get in religious traditions of heaven and hell, or, you know, Huxley famous wrote, famously wrote another essay called Heaven and Hell, that, you know, the difference, those aren't two places you go, there are two types of experiences you can have in a state like this, depending on your orientation to it. I, I would love to think that this is the case, that hell is ego dissolution. Because then there is nothing to worry about. I mean, you've been there a few times like me. Uh, after a while, ego death is no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not hard anymore because you don't fight it. And if you don't fight it, it has no energy. It doesn't come to get you. Uh, it's just the first time when you think you are actually going to disappear because you think you are your ego. So when your ego go, goes, when that, that little knot of associations, that you know, the default mode network in the brain, when that begins to to unravel, you think, my God, that's me, and I'm going to go. No, 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 no. You are the thing that is observing that dissolution. Once you've been through that gauntlet a few times, it's no longer a gauntlet. So I don't think that's it. I don't. That that's certainly not my reason for being afraid of death. My ego will dissolve, and I'll glad shed it. <laughs> I'll gladly let my personal identity go because it's so claustrophobic. I just don't feel claustrophobic all the time because I get used to it. But you go to the void and you come back and you go like, this is not a pleasant state, this ego stuff. Um, so I, I'm per, pretty okay with that, but I have had trips that I could describe as equally... Um, cathartic and hellish and the, the, the difference between mm. pleasure and pain disappears in those experiences it, there isn't that duality anymore that you can only talk about intensity i had an experience once it was a high dose trip and went deep in it was not only high dose 
I was wearing a mind machine. I had done breathing exercises. I had, I don't know, I controlled my diet for a week before that trip. It was when I thought, you know, gloves are off. I'm going to go as deep into this rabbit hole as, as I can go. I was on holidays. So I had read billions of papers, a lot of papers I had read in, in anticipation. I had my doctor to whom I told what I was going to do. I had him give me an um, uh, EKG, ECG, the heart. Uh, EKG heart, for the heart. Yeah, for the heart and the check of my liver function because I wanted to make sure I would come back <laughs> from that. Um, I went really deep in and after you pass ego dissolution, after you pass the fantastic visual hallucinations and the aliens and the parallel universes and all that, and then you pass the void and you keep going. And there is something at the base of the fountain. There is something at the very root of mind, the very root of existence. It, it is the ultimate. Um, now, you understand that whatever I say now is nonsense <laughs> because it cannot be captured in words. So I'll not talk about it. I'll talk around it. Um, and uh, I'll basically hand wave, trying to give you at least a smell of more or less what that felt like. At that fountain, it was like, a multi-hyperdimensional fractal pattern was unfolding. It came from a singularity and nothing, and it began to unfold. And it unfolds based only on itself. There is never anything coming from the outside. It self-unfolds. Um, but it, the richness of this unfolding is beyond anything that can be conceived in an ordinary state of consciousness. And at the same time, it's nothing. That unfolding comes from nothing. In the inside, there is nothing. And out of the nothing comes all of that. Um, and at some point, witnessing that, I was still telling myself uh, narratives. It was one of those trips in which we maintain some level of metacognition, amazingly enough. And at some point, I was telling myself, this is going to fry my mind. Uh, a, a human mind cannot confront this. In other words, be aware of it and survive. It, it, is, it is too entropic. Um, the diversity of states is so massive that you cannot maintain any sense of structural or dynamical integrity. Uh, not that it's random in the sense that neuroscience is trying to study psychedelics now. No, the entropic brain hypothesis, no, entropy levels rise. What they mean is noise, unstructured noise. That's not it at all. It was immensely structured, immensely structured, but structured in such a way that the diversity of states that would arise from that continuously unfolding structure to become acquainted with that was to die, was to lose your internal integrity, to lose everything that defines you as a mind. And uh, that was death. That was real death, not ego death. That is the death of a fry in a frying pan. Um, it's, it's really going to blow you to pieces if you maintain your attention on that. Yeah, and I mean, my fear is that hell and heaven are both that. That is it. That's the fountainhead. It's both hell and heaven. And I understand how and why it can be both, because it's simultaneously terrifying and beyond delightful. It's cathartic. It's of a level of beauty that even the word beauty is like, you know, we need another word. Mm -hmm. That's cosmic beauty. It's, it's, it's beyond anything. <laughs> yeah, well... And it kills you if you stare at it strangely enough i feel like i know exactly what you are talking around here because in my 5mo experience and again talking around it it was quite similar i think i there was this thing and only this thing there was no even perception of myself being there to see it but somehow this thing that somehow didn't have a shape was vibrating or shaking with such intensity that it felt like not only every scene of experience that i was about to come back into was coming from it, but every possible scene of every possible experience that could be was just sort of violently shaking out of this thing. And, and again, the word thing doesn't mean like 
a shape that I saw. It was just this sort of, I, I mean, it was just almost just like seeing light and, and it was just like yeah. everything was wiggling out of it. If I, if I, you will understand it because you probably you've been there. I, I see it, but uh, people who have never been there will not understand it. So for the sake of those who can sense the smell, the reason the fires of hell burn you is because they are unspeakably beautiful. Mm. They are heavenly. <laughs> the fires of hell are heavenly. And that's why they burn, because they are unspeakably beautiful. It's a beauty that dissolves you. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, funny enough, again, um, somebody else who had this experience with me on one occasion described it uh, almost that way. It's like, yeah, I, I felt like I burst into you know the most intense flames ever. And then they just slowly cooled off again. So, you know, people, it, it's remarkable how um, certain aspects of these high dose experiences are remarkably reproducible from person to person, it seems, based on, you know, the language they start to use to try and describe it. Um, we've already been talking for two and a half hours, Bernardo, um, and I believe it's evening for you. So I don't want to take too much more of your time. Are there any um, final thoughts? that you want to leave people with and perhaps any, any of your work that you would point people to if they're unacquainted with you? You can go to Bernardo Kastrup, Kastrup with a K, K-A-S-T-R-U-P of Peter, bernardokastrup.com, and everything is linked from there. Free essays, free technical papers, books, videos, blogs, uh, boom, a whole lot of things. It's all linked from there. Um. Is there anything that you're working on right now that is building on work that you've done already or any, any interesting problems that you think uh, are un unanswered that, that are uh, being worked on by anyone? Uh, immediately after I, I stop talking to you, I have to prepare for a debate tomorrow with the physicist uh, Sabine Hossenfelder. Um, we are going to discuss superdeterminism and quantum physics <laughs> tomorrow. I need to refresh uh, my acquaintance with the literature a little bit. Um, but uh, long term, I am working on a new book that is unlike anything you have ever seen coming from me. <laughs> it's a completely different kind of thing. And um, because what I notice happening in myself is... Uh, the more I get comfortable with the big questions, the more I become invested in the small questions mm. of human life, society, economy, politics, geopolitics, our values, our culture, how it relates to each other and to the world and to animals and forests, the small problems. And, and that's, that, that, that's paradoxical, right? The more you are comfortable with the big things, the more the small things come to the fore as things that need attention, that, that need tender, tending to. All right, Bernardo Castro, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.